When I first started this project, I had no idea it was going to turn out this way. I went into this game expecting it to be a hot pile of garbage, and I thought this would be a short video where I tell you how much this game sucks before moving on to a game that I actually wanted to play. But then something happened. I actually enjoyed the game. My astronomically low expectations were completely subverted, and I enjoyed the game. On my first playthrough. After completing my second playthrough, and after reviewing everything while preparing the script, I'd be lying if I told you that I liked this game at all. You're probably wondering how my feelings towards this game could change so drastically, but it all comes back to expectations. I went into Greedfall on my first playthrough expecting it to be terrible, and it wasn't. I then played the game again, no longer swayed by the things that had impressed me before, and that's when the cracks started to show. I have a policy that I've never actually stated on the channel, but it's something that I learned from my failings with previous videos. First impressions are almost never correct. I can see the argument that your first impressions are the most important because they are your most raw feelings about something, but I don't like basing my arguments off of them. There are many times when I would go back and take a closer look at something I was about to lay some heavy criticism on, only to find out that I was completely mistaken. A great example of this is my combat analysis in my God of War video. I initially thought the combat in the game was terrible and had little flow to it, but the truth is I was playing the game inefficiently. Dozens of reviewers have fallen into the same trap with Doom Eternal's combat. Judging something before you fully understand it is dangerous for any critic or reviewer to do unless that's the standard of your content. I can think of a couple channels that only talk about their first impressions with something and it works for them because they're consistent with it. However, this would never work for my channel. The inverse is also true, and it's the situation I have with Greedfall. I have to be careful not to praise something that is bad just because the game soared past my already low expectations. I'm going to give the game credit for the things that did impress me because some of them are great additions that other games should take note of, but an overwhelming majority of this game doesn't hold up under any real scrutiny. I have a lot to say about this game, much more than I ever thought I would going into it. Some of this is going to be positive, much of it is going to be negative, and it's going to feel more than a little bipolar. The first half of this video is going to be fairly positive as I'll be covering the features that I really like, but the negativity will slowly drown out anything good I have to say about this game. Many topics needed to be partitioned into their own section just to keep this analysis from feeling too disorganized, and I still feel like it lacks a lot of structure. I almost scrapped this project several times while trying to organize my thoughts. I feel like I simply have too much to say and I don't want this video to be one tangled mess of opinions. However, I'd already invested a significant amount of time into this project before the script ever came into the picture, and I can't bring myself to let that time go to waste. I decided after reaching the story section of this script that the only way I was going to get this project done was to do away with my usual structure in favor of something more akin to my older videos, where discussions are talked about in chunks instead of all at once. Many quests in this game have several phases that are triggered at different points in the story and need to be talked about at those points. Many of the sections in this video are going to feel like I'm rambling, but I promise there is a point to all of it. I know exactly where I'm going with these topics. I have a destination in mind, and we are going to land this plane gracefully. I'd also like to mention now that I won't be discussing the Divesp Conspiracy expansion in this video. It honestly feels like more of the same. The quality of writing and quest design isn't an improvement over the main game, and the events don't complement the main story. It just feels like you're paying for additional padding to a game that already has too much padding, and there's not really any room in this video for me to talk about it without hurting the pacing, so I decided that I would just ignore it. And if you plan on playing this game, you probably should too. With all that said, let's talk about Greedfall. As strange as it sounds, I actually can't say much about this game without bringing up the games that I feel must have inspired it. Unfortunately, that means that I don't have a lot of pre-analysis introductory stuff to discuss, but we'll be lucky if we reach spoiler territory within the hour, so there's no need to worry. The CEO of the developer, Spiders, was very clear about their intentions with Greedfall, saying that their hope is to fill the void left by Bioware in recent years. On top of this, the game was also very clearly inspired by The Witcher, and after doing a bit of research, it's clear that I'm not the first person to pick up on this. I'd argue that The Witcher's influence might be a little more present, or rather it's what you can feel the most since it applies to your character directly, but you can also see in the companions and party system that the developers are big fans of Bioware games, and yet I wouldn't go as far as to say that these concepts were outright plagiarized. The term that kept coming to my mind when I played through it was The Witcher Light, since I couldn't stop seeing the glaring similarities between these games. I'd like to clarify that this isn't a criticism or a way of saying that Greedfall is in any way unoriginal, but these influences are so strong that it's hard to separate them from the game. 
Trying to do so would be like trying to describe Bloodborne without bringing up its Lovecraftian elements, or trying to describe them without acknowledging where these concepts came from. It's ironic to me that The Witcher and Dragon Age were inspirations for Greedfall, considering that Dragon Age Origins has some of their own Witcher influences in The Grey Wardens, but the difference between Origins and Greedfall is that the latter shows its influences in its mechanics and structure, not necessarily its story. More specifically, this game is giving off some very strong Bioware vibes when it comes to how companions are handled. As you play through the game, you will gain one companion that represents the game's various factions, and you can only have two of them in your party at once. Their disposition towards you will change depending on your actions and some dialogue choices. After some time passes, they will approach you and ask you for some help with a loyalty mission. You do that for them, you become their best friend, or you enter a relationship with one of them. Once you do, you no longer have any reason to speak to them, and they're deduced to little more than cannon fodder in combat. That last point is especially true for most Bioware games, but surprisingly, it's not very true for Greedfall. Here are some of the many ways that the companion system in this game differs from its inspiration. Most of the companions you recruit don't have pages of dialogue for you to get through during side conversations. You have a handful of topics to explore with an even fewer amount opening up after a loyalty quest, but that's about it. I was a little surprised the first time I saw this and thought for sure the companions were going to end up being shallow with underexplored backstories as a result. But that isn't the case, at least not in this regard. People have claimed this in various reviews I've seen, but I completely disagree. It's easy to think that the lack of dialogue in side conversations is due to budget or time constraints, but I think it's actually intentional. Instead of putting you through an obligatory post-loyalty conversation, you interact with your characters much more while on the job. I was consistently impressed with just how much your companions contribute to various conversations, even outside of dialogue. Many games that sport the Bioware companion system cannot or will not take the time to write unique dialogue and interactions outside of the companion specific missions because it's simply too much work to do. Greedfall is the first action RPG I've played that actually makes your companions part of the conversation outside of loyalty missions. I don't want to give off the impression that they always play an active role in dialogue, but it happened often enough that it felt out of place when these interactions didn't happen. I can't say exactly what percentage of conversations feature interactions like this, but it was frequent enough to make this game noticeably stand out from others like it. I have noticed that there is more companion dialogue for factions that they belong to and are rivals against, but there were still moments where the game surprised me. The most impressive thing about this wasn't just that they had extra dialogue, it's that the conversation could oftentimes steer in different directions because of their presence. There were moments while playing where I often wondered if an encounter would have differed had I decided to bring a different companion along, and there were times when the presence of one was able to bypass a skill check, both in dialogue and gameplay. There were at least two instances where your character needed to consult with a certain companion in order to progress the quest, with the most surprising one for me being when you use Aphra's background as a scientist to help you perform an autopsy if you can't pass the skill check. I also like how the game incorporated party banter. There are many times that your character will bounce ideas off your party members, or as is more often the case, they will share some of their thoughts that help lead you towards the next objective. In many cases, this is used as a way of contextualizing the quest marker. There were a few times where I would stop and ask myself, how did my character figure out where to go next? Because you are almost always told by an NPC or work out with your party where you're supposed to go. The information isn't specific enough for you to complete these quests without the marker, unfortunately, but there were very few moments where the quest marker felt contrived. A good example happens early in the game. One of the side quests in the prologue has you smuggling some items to the island you're traveling to on behalf of the guard. The ship captain, Vasco, is adamantly opposed to it, but one way or another you get the products to the island. After speaking with the quartermaster, he tells you that you now need to go retrieve the shipment since they aren't able to do it. If you have Vasco in your party when you have this conversation, then he'll confront you about it when it's finished. My ship's being used to move your contraband, and now you want to sneak into one of our warehouses. Kurt was given the order. If we want to help him, we don't have a choice. I don't like this. But, since I've been sacked, let's just say that this will be a little bit of revenge. How are we to know in which warehouse we'll find this damn cargo? I'm afraid we're going to have to take a look at all of them. That won't be necessary. My entire cargo has been placed in the warehouse closest to my ship. And if you wouldn't mind wearing some Nort clothing, we'll be less suspicious. I would like to avoid fighting with my own. The Norts are my family. There's nothing inherently impressive about this interaction, but it's the lack of moments like this in other games that make it stand out. It feels like the game is paying attention. 
there were many more things about the dialogue that impressed me as well. Minor characters that you previously interacted with will remember you. Members of specific organizations will remark on the things you've done for them in side content or how they've been affected by bigger events that have occurred. Even your character remembers smaller locations that they've been to previously when they're reused for another quest, which is something so small that makes a world of difference since you, as the player, aren't the only one acknowledging that this is an area you've already been to. A good example is this cave that you come to twice. The first time when you find the dead bodies of some missing natives, and later when looking for a sailor who's in hiding. Here is the cave that our protege told us about. I can't say that I have a good memory of this place. The only problem with this sequence is that the bodies are still here despite their relatives supposedly having retrieved them, but I was still very impressed that the developers thought to add what amounts to little more than a throwaway line just to make the entire world feel more cohesive. There's something deeply satisfying when details from unrelated quests tie back together in ways that you didn't expect, and after completing every single side quest except for a single exploration collectathon, I can safely say that most of it does. Even quests that I had previously missed and completed a couple hours before finishing the game paid off by tying back into the main events. Of course, it's worth mentioning that this is excluding the game's pitiful writing that you'll get to suffer through for over half of this video. I don't want to give off the impression that this game's reactive dialogue is perfect, however, because there are many cracks that I found. Some of the most frustrating ones were when your character outright suggests bringing a companion along with you to help negotiate with a group of people just to find that they didn't have a single line of dialogue to add to the conversation. This was with a companion that I didn't really care for and felt was useless in a fight too, so dragging him along just for him to say nothing was irritating. Other times are when you need information for something that you could have easily gotten from one of your companions if you had only asked. Siora is especially bad with this since she knows almost everything about the native's culture, including many of their rituals and secrets, but she'll just follow you around not saying a word as you go door to door interrogating natives about things that she already knows. Even a small line of dialogue where she acknowledges that she doesn't have the information or simply refuses to share it would be welcome. I think it's the fact that she does have dialogue like this in other interactions, so it feels out of place when she doesn't. I also can't praise the way the game handle companions without talking about the glaring flaws. Nobody in your party really fights with each other, which makes absolutely no sense given their background. They will occasionally bicker about something relatively insignificant, and I have lost reputation because of this on at least one occasion, but it's still worth mentioning. I think this can be seen the worst with Petrus, Siora, and Aphra. All three of these come from nations that are actively at war with each other. Siora should be especially distrustful of them since the natives are being kidnapped, tortured, and in some cases brainwashed by these people, but they never actually fight. There are scenes in Mass Effect 2 where on at least two occasions, two of your companions are on the verge of killing each other and you need to step in to prevent it. I don't think this is a perfect example because it has its own set of issues, like how you can't remain neutral and talk them down without a heavy amount of Paragon or Renegade points, but it still makes at least some amount of sense and shows that your ragtag team of suicidal freaks is struggling to get along. I never really cared for these parts in the game since they felt too sudden and you never got to witness the build up to the encounter, but at the very least they made sense. These three characters should be at each other's throats constantly, and it should be up to you to prevent a fight, maybe even at the cost of some companion reputation. A minor clash of personality isn't enough to cover just how badly these people should hate each other. They should be doing anything they can to undercut each other. They should be paranoid, maybe even coming up with false accusations because of that. Petrus should be trying to actively convert the entire party to his faith and put you in a situation where everybody approaches you at once to ask you to intervene. Aphra should be constantly observing Siora, asking for her consent to run a small experiment on her before proceeding to do it regardless since her asking was just a courtesy. Siora should be extremely suspicious of these two and could be having violent outbursts over little things because she's already fed up with their collective bullshit long before they ever met. This would put you, Kurt, and Vasco in the awkward situation of trying to keep them from killing each other since your respective factions generally have good relationships with the others. You three would have to form the Council of the Boys as you try to figure out how you're going to deal with them. Should you decide to back out into neutrality every time a conflict arises, then you might run the risk of some of your party members leaving, or if we really want to take this to an extreme, killing the others. This game already has situations like this, just for far less interesting reasons. This issue really ties into a larger problem with the game not willing to follow through with including meaningful choices, and this is where we depart from Bioware territory and start delving into how this game relates to The Witcher. The interesting thing about The Witcher 3 is just how many people were able to walk blindly into a game with no prior knowledge of its setting and still enjoy it, despite having to piece everything together on their own. For some people this may have been half the fun, but I remember understanding next to nothing that the characters were talking about on my first playthrough. 
This was very overwhelming to try and make sense of what everybody was saying, and I actually gave up on it after arriving at Velen on my very first playthrough. It wasn't until a year later when I came back to give it another try and started enjoying myself. Once I got accustomed to the different names, characters, and factions, I found everything easy to follow, but it took me until the middle of my second playthrough to fully grasp many of the concepts. Greedfall took this concept of dropping the player into the middle of a world with a pre-established character and based the entire game on it. Unlike The Witcher 3, you're allowed to ask many questions about the world and get information on the factions you'll be engaging with, but everything else is played out just like The Witcher. Just like how Geralt will always be Geralt, Desarde will always be Desarde. It doesn't matter how you want to roleplay, your character will always have a predetermined backstory and moral disposition. You will always be very close with your cousin Constantine, you will always be a diplomat first, and you will always be a morally just character even if you are allowed to flex these morals a little bit for the sake of getting the job done. You will never have full control of what Desarde says in dialogue, and just like in The Witcher 3, you probably won't always agree with what they have to say because of this. Most of your choices in dialogue are delegated to asking questions and making the big decisions, but just like Geralt, each decision comes from the perspective of the character. There is the occasional decision that feels completely out of character, but 99% of them aren't. The Witcher has its own fair share of incidents like this one, so if you've played that game, you should understand what I'm talking about. No, 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 my leg! As has been proven with the runaway success of The Witcher 3, this isn't an inherently bad decision for a character in an RPG. In fact, I think I might enjoy this a little more than playing a blank slate character as long as it's done well. The Witcher and Greedfall do this very well, while Fallout 4 is an example of it done poorly. I think there are several benefits of this style of RPG design that Greedfall was able to capitalize on. For starters, it justifies the main character being voice acted. It isn't impossible to enjoy a game where a blank slate protagonist is voice acted, but much more work needs to be done if they are. Since the player is meant to be the deciding factor for how a blank slate character thinks and acts, there needs to be a greater variety of dialogue options for an array of different political and moral beliefs, and it is more difficult and costly to pull that off. It's not impossible, but I think Cyberpunk has shown everybody what happens when you let your ambition get out of control. By making your character and choices much more focused, the developers gave themselves a lot more freedom, especially regarding quests. As a pre-established character, the developers are able to make a story much more personal since Desarde's backstory can come into play when writing it, and it does. Personally, I think that the approach that Greedfall takes with its story simply wouldn't work if Desarde was a blank slate character, and I think the game is just as successful with this approach as The Witcher was with Geralt. Except it needs to be said that Greedfall's writing is shit, so that affects the impact a lot. I'd also like to mention that one of the many dialogue pitfalls that plague RPGs these days aren't present in Greedfall, and that being the preview text not matching up with what your character actually says. Instead of giving you a sample of what Desarde says, dialogue options are presented in a description of what you are going to say instead of trying to condense it into vague sample text. If a dialogue option is going to threaten somebody, the dialogue option will be presented as threaten them. If you're going to ask for something, the game will tell you exactly what you will be asking them. I didn't really give this system much thought until I started comparing it to RPGs that Bioware had made, which is how I spotted the difference. This is a small detail that prevents a lot of headache while still keeping dialogue options concise. There was never really a moment while playing this game where I didn't know what Desarde was going to say. Even if I didn't know the exact words, I knew what the message was going to be, and I think that's the most important thing. This really shouldn't be revolutionary, but for some reason it is, and I think the developers really deserve credit for it. So, that was a lot of talking for something as simple as dialogue, but I hope you can see what I found so impressive about it. Let's go ahead and move past this discussion and get into what I consider to be this game's disclaimer. There are many different things that a game can demand from a player. Some games demand your skill or ability. They require quick reflexes and pattern recognition in order to overcome their challenges. Most games like this have a strong focus on combat. Some games demand your attention, requiring you to really focus on what it's showing you to understand the message. Some games demand your mental ability or intelligence. Puzzle games are a good example. Some games demand an emotional connection to really experience it the way the developers want you to. This is seen in both horror games and the more artsy games like Kentucky Route Zero and What Remains of Edith Finch. These are just a few examples that aren't mutually exclusive. A game can require two or more of these things, but Greedfall... Greedfall requires your patience. It took me just over 40 hours to complete this game on my first playthrough, and there were many things about it that would have made me quit playing if I didn't stick it out and get through it. The game's prologue is one of these things, the combat and exploration being up there as well, but probably the biggest thing that I couldn't stomach was the sheer amount of jank. The facial animations are some of the worst I've ever seen in a game, almost impressively bad. I solved this by reading the subtitles instead of looking at their faces, but it still needs to be said just how bad these are. 
There are also no animations during dialogue. This can be seen as early as the prologue when your character tries to expose the charlatan for selling fake miracle potions. Your character insists that the merchant try one of the potions he's selling, and instead of showing the man actually drinking the potion, the game simply cuts to black and has your character exclaim that he saw the man take the vial out of his pocket and drink from it. This is something that happens all the time in the game, which is weird because there are cutscenes that are fully animated, but these moments in dialogue aren't. There are also the arbitrary barriers while exploring. Most inaccessible areas are blocked off entirely, but there were at least three instances where they weren't. The first one was when I was looking for an alternate route into an area for a side quest I was doing. The only accessible way through were two bottleneck skills that I didn't have any points in, and I managed to climb to another ledge that wasn't supposed to be accessible. It didn't really take a lot of work since there was a spot that you could easily walk on, but I hid an invisible barrier since these ledges are meant to be used as an exit only, not an entrance. The other example was when my character couldn't pass over a small tree blocking the path. This is apparently enough to stop them in their tracks. The worst example was a, quote, hidden entrance to an area that requires a quest to progress. Apparently, the small patch of leaves is all it takes to keep you out. This one is even worse considering that Desarde basically admits he didn't know this was here when you come back later. This is the place which was depicted on the mural in the Cave of Knowledge. Vimbar must have hidden the passage to the sanctuary. If things like this in games bother you, then you'll be happy to know that these were the worst examples I could find, although it can be annoying when you're discouraged from exploring levels thoroughly because the area almost always relates to a quest, so there's nothing to see there otherwise. As much as I praised the companions a moment ago, they get really annoying when they keep repeating the same voice lines repeatedly in combat. I don't know why more lines weren't recorded or these weren't removed at all. The issue is twice as bad considering that companions will remind you to take a magic potion every single time your mana pool gets too low, and you can hear this hundreds of times during some of the boss fights. At the same time, you're going to get sick to death of hearing Desarde give the same introduction for every new NPC you meet, and over the course of 40 hours, you are going to meet what feels like thousands of NPCs. You can tell that even the voice actor gets sick of saying it since they start finding ways to cheat and shorten the greeting as time goes on. This detail is funny to me because it feels like both you, the voice actor, and Desarde himself are getting sick of the monotony. Speaking of voice acting blunders, there is at least one voice line in the game that is repeated twice, likely because the first take was incorrect, but they decided to keep the first half of it and forgot to remove the second. There's also the issue of voice lines not matching the subtitles, but I have experienced this in so many games that I'm willing to give this one a pass. Then again, after the number of typos I encountered in the Metro novels and Daggerfall, I've become completely desensitized to things like this. Probably the biggest problem with this game is that it is so slow to get settled into your build, or at least it was for me. By the time I figured out what skills I needed and got everything situated, I was about 15 hours into the game, and according to many other reviews I've read, they have had similar experiences. It's a time investment just to get a foothold in the game, and once you do, things become so easy that the combat becomes more of a chore than an engaging experience. Some of you more hardcore RPG fans are going to say 15 hours to settle into a build is pretty standard, so this is likely more of a problem with the sheer number of bottleneck skills in this game than anything else. The game becomes progressively easier and opens up as time goes on, but it just takes too long to get to that point, and once you do, then the combat has already become stale. By the end of my second playthrough, I was so sick of combat that I was considering just giving up from finishing the game since there were no major plot decisions to make and I knew how everything was going to end. I finally just settled for turning the difficulty to the easiest setting so I didn't have to deal with combat. There's also the issue of capes. These will always give you a one point bonus to your charisma talent, which means that they're quite possibly the most useful piece of equipment, but I could never bring myself to actually wear them because they weren't properly modeled over your character's armor. There's a gap between two that bother me so much, I would only put it on if I suspected there was a speech check ahead. The capes are quite possibly the greatest drip this game has, and they managed to screw it up. And am I the only one who was extremely bothered by the fact that every NPC has their weapon visible on their character model except for you? This isn't something that you can toggle on and off in the settings, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that this actually pissed me off with how immersion breaking it was. My character just pulled a claymore out of his ass like something you'd find on a sword swallower's OnlyFans whenever enemies came into range. Meanwhile, everybody else in the world actually had animations tied to them drawing their weapons, and I can't decide if this is a glitch or spiders literally decided that your character should be the only one in the world who can materialize weapons out of thin air. 
This isn't exclusive to Greedfall either. I hate it in Fallout 4 too, but at least in that game I can play it in first person and pretend that my weapons are being holstered, whereas in Greedfall I have to compromise some of my sanity in order to get through it. The thing that frustrated me the most is that having my big ass claymore on my back would actually have solved the problem I had with the cape separating from the armor model, so this completely ruined any chance of me tolerating it. Dear future developers who want to make third person role playing games, don't put in the work to make weapons visible on character models and then proceed to not allow the player to participate in it. This should really be something that you can toggle on and off in the settings. That's my brief disclaimer of the things that you'll need to adjust to in order to play this game. I can't blame anybody for quitting before they completed the prologue alone, which about 30% of people do according to Steam achievements. I'm one of the 5% of Steam players who have even finished this game, which makes me wonder how it has received such critical reception. The best I can conclude is that the people who gave this game glowing review scores didn't actually finish it, which is more than a little misleading for people who wanted a true RPG experience. Regardless, let's go ahead and move on to the topic of gameplay. Greedfall has a surprising amount of variety in its gameplay, although none of it is particularly good. Let's start with probably the most complicated of the bunch, the skill system. The system is broken into three different portions, skills, attributes, and talents. The skills are the huge web that looks intimidating at first, but is actually pretty straightforward once you understand what's going on. There are three different skill trees in this web that will occasionally cross over into each other since you will likely dabble in more than one tree. Most skill upgrades are incremental percentage bonuses, but over time you can unlock the ability to use different weapons or unlock more interesting moves for your character. The system gives off the impression that each tree is equal in effectiveness, which just isn't true. Melee combat is by far the least interesting with the most restrictive moveset, while Tactician is far more enjoyable and has a much higher damage output. Magic is slightly more enjoyable than melee combat once you get far enough into the skill tree, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't consider resetting all my skill points and putting them into Tactician by the end of my second playthrough. We'll talk more about that when we discuss combat. The next page covers your attributes. These give you more percentage bonuses, but are also required for you to use higher level equipment. I never felt like any of them were very useful outside of meeting those requirements to upgrade my gear, so it's a shame that attribute points come more frequently than talents. These are used in much more practical ways. Science and Vigor are bottleneck skills that every playthrough can benefit from. Vigor allows you to climb and access shortcuts in the environment, and it gives you a passive health regeneration outside of combat. Science allows you to craft just about everything except for gear upgrades, including quest items, and if you're playing Tactician, you want the skill so you can keep yourself stocked on ammo and traps. Even after 40 hours of playtime, I never felt I had unlocked every talent that I wanted, and that's because I didn't realize just how many barriers you can run into if you don't put points into skills like Intuition. Lockpicking is useful, but almost all mandatory locks have a key somewhere, so all it really does is save time. The rewards you get from lock chests are so basic that they aren't even worth the skill investment, which is something we'll talk more about during the exploration section. Craftsmanship isn't really a useful skill either outside of a few uses and quests, and the only reason I was tempted to bother with it is because there is only one blacksmith in the entire game that can craft gear upgrades. Likewise, there is only one alchemist in the entire game if you haven't invested in science, and it's in a completely different city. The blacksmith wasn't too big of a deal since I was frequently returning to that city anyways to turn in quests, but it was still annoying to know that I would have to backtrack all the way to New Serene if I wanted to upgrade my gear. You gain one skill point per level, one attribute point per two levels, and one talent point every three levels. Leveling in this game isn't hard as long as you're doing all the side quests and not ignoring every fight you come across, but waiting three levels to put a single point into a talent that you might need later gets frustrating very quickly and makes the entire system feel like an excessive grind. I get the idea is to specialize your character for different situations, and that would work fine if all builds were treated equal, but there are many situations I ran into where I would have been completely unable to progress without investing in some talents. Recall back to when I said I was stopped by an invisible wall while trying to climb somewhere I wasn't supposed to be. I didn't do this to try and break the game, I did it because I hadn't invested in science or vigor yet and the quest wasn't willing to provide alternate solutions. This wasn't the only quest where the game wasn't prepared to offer neutral solutions, but no other example stood out in my mind as much as this one because it was the first wall I hit while I was questing. You could argue that if there was always a solution around skill checks, then that would make them redundant, but you should still offer alternate solutions for players who haven't invested in them. An example of this done well comes a little later in the game, when you're going to explore some ruins on the top of a plateau. You can purchase the quest item needed to repair the gate mechanism and proceed to the top, or if you have a high enough science skill and the necessary resources, you can blow out a wall that will allow you to bypass the enemies in the next room. The same thing is done with vigor checks in many quests. You can skip large portions of this cave if you've invested enough in this skill 
skill to take the shortcuts. This rewards the player for their investments while not impeding the progress of those who don't have these talents. It needs to be said that there are ways to get through these mandatory talent checks that don't involve grinding out levels. Probably the easiest solution is in the form of gear upgrades. Most Kyrus's have an upgrade slot that will put an extra point into a specific talent. Not all talents are available, but ones like Science, Vigor, and Lockpicking are. A Science of 1 is high enough to blow out any of the thin walls that are associated with the skill, but it isn't high enough to craft the mixtures needed to do so. These mixtures can almost always be bought from a merchant, so for a little bit of gold you can get past the skill check. The problem I have with this stems back to what I mentioned earlier. There is only one blacksmith in this game that can upgrade your gear. So to use this solution, you would need to fast travel back to New Serene, spend the money on any ingredients you don't have to craft the upgrade, spend more money to acquire the mixture, and then find the nearest fast travel point to your objective in order to proceed. Constantly making trips like this adds up over time, and I usually resorted to borrowing Vasco's clothes that had a lockpick bonus in order to bypass the skill check. And I don't think I need to describe why your character swapping outfits with their companion to unlock a door is harmful to the immersion. The other solution takes much more time. Each companion offers a bonus to a specific talent if you have a high enough reputation with them. Generally, completing their loyalty mission is enough to increase your standing, and once you've reached a friendly reputation, the bonus is unlocked. Every attribute is covered except for lockpicking, and while the system is a good way to make up for the scarcity of talent points, I always found that it conflicted with the characters that I wanted to take on missions. I always liked keeping Siora in my party for her healing abilities in combat, but I never needed her vigor bonus since I already had it covered with upgrades. I invested heavily in science to make sure I could craft more ammo than I ever needed, which means that taking Afro on missions is inefficient since she offers a bonus to science, even though I think that she has some interesting interactions. Having both of these characters in my party had some very interesting moments in dialogue, but was a waste of their respective talent bonuses, so I had to choose between what I cared about more in the moment. The inverse is also true. If you've come to rely on these bonuses to get through areas of the game, then it becomes frustrating when you don't have them with you the moment you would need them. I ran into this a lot with Vasco since his intuition bonus was invaluable to me, and I had to choose between bringing him on the mission and missing out on unique dialogue interactions, or leaving him behind and not being able to pass the skill check when it occurred. I oftentimes chose the latter and lost a lot of reputation points when combat became the only solution. I can think of several times that something similar would have happened with Siora if I hadn't thought to bring her with me when interacting with the distrustful natives. So despite the game's best attempts to cover your bases with talents, you will almost always be in need of them. I appreciate that these bonuses were implemented at all, but I still feel like I ended up with far more skill points than I needed over the course of the game, especially due to some things we'll be talking about when discussing exploration. The skill system in general is very interesting, but there aren't really enough interesting abilities to be unlocked for it to be considered great. Something that I really don't understand is why two-handed weapons require such a heavy investment into the melee skill tree, when these should be a default specialization that you can choose from the start. What result is you wasting skill points maxing out one-handed weapons when you will never touch them again by the time you get your hands on a claymore? And once you do, there's nothing exciting to do with it. The inverse is also true. Players who rely on one-handed weapons are shafted by over half of the skill tree because the other half is reserved for two-handed weapons. Most of the upgrades in both trees are just more damage and stun, with the special move you unlock at the end of the melee tree being a complete waste of time. Tactician was by far the most enjoyable in almost every way, but we'll discuss that more when we get into combat. I especially dislike how talent checks were implemented into the dialogue system. There is no real difference between a speech and intuition check, except a speech check has a dice roll and intuition requires a certain number of points. It's like the devs didn't really know what they wanted their speech system to be, so they just lazily implemented two different skills that are virtually the exact same with a different barrier of entry. It almost seems obvious that the game needs more varied speech checks that truly work in favor of your character's specialization. This would work perfectly with the attributes if they were implemented in a way that makes sense. Fallen New Vegas has an impressive number of skill checks and dialogue that tie directly to your special stats, and I see no reason why Greedfall couldn't have done the same thing with their various attributes. Threatening people is probably the most common dialogue choice you get when it comes to confrontation, but it's never clear whether it will work or not. This seems like something that could be tied towards your strength attribute, with the difficulty that varies depending on the size of the group you're threatening and their profession. Threatening a group of five battle-hardened soldiers should only work if you appear to be more than a match for them, which you almost always are. As of now, the threaten option is just a shot in the dark that always makes you come off as an asshole, all because there are two bottleneck skills that will sometimes have creative workarounds, but often won't. 
Do you really mean to tell me that an attribute called mental power couldn't find a place in skill checks? You couldn't use your accuracy attribute to impress a native hunter with your hunting prowess? Agility could fall into this category too. These ideas aren't great, but I think you can see how much more could be done with the system instead of just settling for two options that function virtually the same with a different barrier of entry. There are other areas where this issue exists too. Recall back to when I praised the game for using your companions in creative ways by having you bring Afra to help you perform an autopsy. The reason I needed her help, despite having three points in science, was because for some reason, that specific skill check didn't require science, it required intuition. A skill of which I had almost no points in, despite constantly telling myself to invest in it for literally the entire game. This doesn't make any sense considering that for another side quest where you're also trying to determine the cause of death of some people, it does require a science skill check. For another quest, it doesn't require any skills at all to determine that the men were poisoned because it's meant to be obvious, and yet the doctor stationed at the camp couldn't figure it out. We'll be coming back to this quest, don't you worry. There's also the issue of the game requiring skill checks for dialogue options that should be common sense with no alternatives provided. There's one example where a disgruntled native refuses to give you information you need and your only choices are to pass an intuition check, threaten him, or just leave. Threatening him will work here, but you'll lose reputation points when the solution provided by the check feels too obvious. There's another case just like that where one of the leaders refuses to believe evidence you found about their faith in one of the native holy sites. You've already cleared this cave of everything that wants you dead, so the obvious response would be offering to take her there yourself so she can see firsthand that you're not lying. But for some reason, this common sense solution is locked behind an intuition check, which just feels stupid. This one isn't as bad since it offers a speech check as another option, but the ones that don't are just frustrating. The same can be said about the ones that result in a combat encounter that will cause you to lose reputation with a faction because your character forgot all his diplomacy skills when it actually mattered. This can happen when people you're talking to aren't even being aggressive towards you, which just makes no sense, especially for reasons we'll get into in a moment. I have more problems with skill checks and dialogue that I'll get into when discussing how skills actually work in this game. For now, let's go ahead and move on. My opinions on exploration in this game switched between loving and hating it until I finally settled on silent apathy. Leaving the prologue and arriving at the island where the game takes place was a great feeling, and I couldn't help but feel excited to explore what was waiting for me. I think it needs to be said that the three main cities in this game are extraordinarily well realized. Their layouts and architecture feel distinct from each other and represent their respective factions very well. San Mateus especially with its use of chapels and towers that match the religious fundamentalism which serves as the backbone of their nation. Something similar can be seen in Hickmet with the far less structured, more chaotic layout that shows how little planning went into its construction. Then there's your main city, New Serene, where half of it is dominated by scaffolding as the city is still under construction. None of these cities are particularly large, I'd say they're just a bit bigger than Oxenfurt from The Witcher 3, but what's important is that they maintain a high level of believability. San Mateus and Hikmet feel like you're exploring small pockets of a larger city, and New Serene feels like you're seeing the early stages of what will become an equally impressive city. Each of them has a unique appearance that reflects the nations who built them while still staying true to the general Baroque style that inspired much of this game's setting. The only issue with the cities is that all of the palaces and barracks reuse the same layout, and this only really works for the barracks for reasons we'll get into when discussing factions. After arriving at New Serene and seeing just how impressive and believable it was, I was ready to get out into the world and explore, and as I made my way into the unknown, I hit my first bit of disappointment. The game's map is not one map that you travel across, it is broken up by loading screens. While you're waiting for an area to load, you're placed in a separate intermission zone that gives you access to a workbench, a vendor to buy and sell things from, and all your companions for you to speak to and arrange your party before proceeding. I actually think this is a better way to handle the number of loading screens you need to get through while traveling for quests, but I wish the vendor here also served as a crafter or alchemist so I wouldn't have to backtrack all the way to New Serene or Hickmet anytime I wanted to use their services. This small hub area might be a little immersion breaking for some people, especially when you're supposedly the first outsider to ever travel to a certain area, but the fully stocked nuclear arms dealer has already set up camp while waiting for his favorite client to arrive, but I do think having access to this merchant and his high quality gear was almost always a positive for my playthrough, and I never really considered this area canon. It was just an interactive loading screen that allowed me to restock and check if my companions had any updates to their quests. Once your region is loaded, you can leave the travel zone and proceed to actually explore the area. You can find various campsites around the map that serve as permanent fast travel and resting points. Since the area is already loaded, fast travel between campsites is near instant, at least on PC. If you're willing to set out and explore, you'll be surprised how little there is to actually find in this world. 
Probably the most interesting thing was the skill point altars. These immediately grant you a single skill point and only a handful of them require talent checks to access. I thought this was really cool when I found them, and I started meticulously searching every corner of the world to try and find more. I was paying close attention to other things that might give boost to your talents and attributes, or even some legendary gear. As it turns out, these skill altars are the only thing like this in this game, which is a big missed opportunity. I don't see why there couldn't be a handful of altars out in the world that grant you additional attribute or talent points. This would help smooth out the early game level grind and have greater benefits in the late game. I had all the skill points that I needed long before the end of the game, and I accumulated so many that I was practically throwing them away, but I was always just one or two points shy of what I needed to pass a talent check. After exploring for a while, you inevitably run into some of its other problems. There are many skill checks, specifically Vigor, that lead to additional loot and resources. If you have a high enough investment in these talents to cross these areas, then you'll see the rewards they bring are never worth the skill investment. Spiders clearly thought that locking away high-level gear behind a talent that some players would never engage with is unfair, so the loot you find in these areas is just standard gear that only exists to be sold at a vendor. Lock chests also have this problem, and it begs the question of why they were included at all if the rewards aren't going to be worthwhile. I also don't understand why there are so many bottleneck skills when there could be more alternatives. Why is lockpicking the only way to get into locked doors and chests when using your science skill to craft an acid that can melt the lock would be more interesting and rewarding? Why is crafting a bomb with alchemy the only way to bypass these fragile walls when you could logically break it with magic or a high enough strength attribute? Why is vigor the only way to climb walls, make jumps, and walk across fallen trees that conveniently make a small bridge when you can incorporate the craftsmanship skill to create ladders or larger boards that are more easy to walk across? Ladder guy. Yeah? What can you do to help our team? Oh, well, uh, let's just say you're in a situation where you need to get up high. I can bring you up high with my ladder. Let's just say you need to get down low. And that's just the beginning of it, right? Is that the beginning? Because yeah. it sounds like the end of it. Adding more ways for players to pass these checks would mean that the loot they guard can be more interesting. But because the intentions of the system was as simple as RPGs have skill checks, so Greedfall needs to have skill checks, they didn't really think about providing more solutions that would make sense. I think the fact that I have more to say about exploring the cities in this game than the actual world speaks for itself. I don't know why so many developers miss the mark when it comes to exploring open worlds. The visuals alone aren't always enough to carry the experience, and the smaller zones in Greedfall meant the developers could have packed the area with more interesting loot. The fact that you'll never find half of the items that the Travel Pause vendor sells out in the environment is a serious missed opportunity, and finding some of these items could have made exploring each area feel more worthwhile. I can't think of a single moment where I was actually excited to loot something, which is a shame because it's exactly what this game needs. I don't necessarily need a game to give me a constant dopamine rush to hold my interest, but there's no real exploration in this game, which really takes away from the premise of the main story. The game can't provide an interesting narrative with each of these zones, and it isn't willing to provide interesting loot, so why is this game even open world in the first place? There's no sense of wonder or discovery, so why did they even bother? All that's left to discuss is the combat, and this is probably where I have the most mixed feelings. Greedfall's combat feels like a better version of The Witcher 3, and while that may sound like a compliment, I don't regard that game as something you want your combat associated with in the first place. Let's start with the basics. There are three different classes you can choose to start your character from, and they each follow the main three RPG archetypes. Warriors have access to melee weapons, and melee combat in this game is awful. You only have access to two different attacks, and if you use swords, then that's really only one attack because your kick doesn't actually do any damage. Attacking does build up your fury meter, which can be used to activate another move that is guaranteed to land a hit, but even then, that puts the total number of attacks at three, with no unique combos to weave between them. Mages can range enemies with their spells and have access to some more interesting skills, but Greedfall is another in a long line of RPGs that makes their mages manage their magic pool with warriors being allowed to swing their sword indefinitely. Try saying that three times fast. This is actually something I hate about modern RPGs, and it's the number one reason that trying to play a pure magic character in Skyrim is so frustrating. Because it usually boils down to you chucking enough mana potions to burst every red blood cell in your body, which doesn't make things more interesting, only more tedious. I think the system worked perfectly fine in games like Morrowind and Daggerfall because your fatigue could affect your hit chance of both spells and melee attacks, and spellcrafting meant you got to tailor your arsenal to work within the limitations of your mana pool. Greedfall doesn't feature anything like this, so it turns magic combat into a massive slog, but even then, it's still more enjoyable than melee combat, which is ironic because you're immediately paired with heavy weapons when you select the mage class in character creation. 
The mage skill tree is slightly more interesting than the others with some of the more useful perks like healing yourself and party members, but it's sorely lacking in AoE attacks which makes it a worse choice in group combat than the other two trees. That's not even mentioning just how long it takes you to do more than the minimum amount of damage to enemies. Even when you get to that point, your damage output is so low that you'll frequently be considering if it's worth your time. I think the damage output is so low because magic negates enemy armor, but it still makes many of the boss fights a massive slog. What's worse is that there is more specialization in the melee and tactician trees than there is with magic, which just feels ass backwards. Tactician is the objectively best way to play this game. It has the highest damage output, the most varied tool set, and feels outright required in some encounters due to its ability to shred enemy armor, which allows you to start doing actual damage. Tactician focuses on crowd control in several ways, but it has the drawback of being based purely on resource management and not being allowed to stand on its own without one of the other two classes. Since firearms are considered a form of equipment instead of a weapon, you can't actually hold them as your primary weapon, so you either need to pair it with a melee weapon or magic. Just like the weapon model issue, it makes no sense to me that other characters can use exclusively firearms as their primary weapon, but you can't. Regardless, this is likely a safety net for when you inevitably run out of ammo in the early game. Tactician's skill tree is by far the most interesting to me, offering the most amount of actually useful skills whereas warriors mostly offer weapon specializations and incremental stat increases. Using the tactician skill tree, you'll learn to set traps, which can be upgraded to be thrown at enemies, you'll increase the effectiveness with firearms and unlock the ability to use rifles, and you'll cap off the skill tree with a new ability that throws a bomb at enemies at the cost of all your fury. This can be upgraded to increase its area of effect in poison enemies caught in the blast, which makes it the most useful crowd control ability in the game. So, you're probably wondering how Tactician could be so fun if it relies on the most resource management, and that's because resource management in this game is a thoughtless inclusion that shouldn't exist. Those of you who gave up early in the game will be surprised just how little resource management actually matters with a high science skill. With a science of 3, which you can achieve fairly quickly if you focus your points properly, you can craft every consumable in the game at a very small price. Resource management is a big part of this class early on, but by the end of the game I had well over 900 bullets, and the only thing I lacked were more files because I often just saved up enough fury for the bomb. Tying ammunition and files to a resource only works if those resources aren't dirt cheap from any vendor in the game. Not even mentioning how you will come by thousands of it if you're actively exploring and collecting everything you come by. Not to mention that dedicating an entire skill tree to a fighting style that functionally serves as a secondary weapon is a bad idea to begin with. If Tactician was designed to complement the other two styles, then these perks shouldn't have been exclusive to this entire portion of the skill tree. Otherwise, this class should be treated equally beside the other two fighting styles and you should have to fully commit to using firearms. It would have been cool to be able to dual wield pistols at the cost of an effective melee attack or commit to rifles that you can attach a bayonet to so you're not completely useless when fighting up close. You could even specialize between rifles and shotguns with different advantages between both. Just for the record, all three of these weapons already exist in the game, they're just functionally identical. I think similar changes could be made in all the skill trees, and given the fact that Tactician isn't allowed to stand on its own as a valid fighting style, these changes would make it much better. They just need to lower the damage output of firearms since using them is just one step short of killing enemies with console commands. This also comes back to the issue of redundant features. Why are you going to include concepts like resource management if they can be so easily ignored? This doesn't add depth to the combat, it just becomes a chore to deal with. Even after having enough ammo to put myself on a federal watch list, I still found myself getting into the routine of crafting more just because I've been doing it for 40 hours. The decision to tie this class to resources left it underexplored and overpowered. I think some amount of resource management could have worked if it was implemented properly, maybe a Bloodborne style system where you can only hold a maximum amount of ammo and files that would restock after each combat encounter, but this would only work in tandem with the other changes that I proposed. As always, I don't think these ideas are flawless, but they show just how much more could have been done with what I already considered to be the best of a bad bunch in this skill system. All of this, and we haven't even talked about the biggest weakness in Greedfall's combat, enemy variety. This game sets some very bad expectations regarding the game's enemy variety. At the end of the prologue, you get to fight an exotic enemy that was taken from the island that the game takes place on. This immediately got me thinking about what kind of crazy enemies I'd encounter once I actually got there, and as a wise man once said, reality is often disappointing. Once you've made it to Tier 4D, you'll get to fight such exciting enemies as reskinned bears, reskinned buffaloes, giant bats, giant lizards, different giant lizards that slap you with their tail, once again discouraging melee combat, and the expansion brings one new enemy, Jumping Lions. 
truly some game-changing results from two years of development. My impressions were lifted slightly whenever I encountered one of the various bosses, which is where the enemy from the prologue came from, but this also gets stale when you realize that there are only five of these, two of which aren't even that visually distinct from one another. Their movesets are more varied, but the only one that doesn't have a pseudo-clone is the Mountain Guardian, which happens to be the one that feels like it was made without regard to melee builds. I really don't see why these enemies couldn't have had more unique models tied to them. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad if these encounters were more rare, but you'll be fighting so many guardians in this game you'll get sick of them long before it's over. Every enemy in this game except for humans have the issue of awkward telegraphs that do an obscene amount of damage. The buffaloes in particular were extremely annoying in the early game because their charge attack could do half of my health bar on medium difficulty, and using the lock-on can cause you to dodge into the direction of their tracking. This issue is slightly alleviated with the dodge roll, which somebody had the bright idea of making you unlock it through a skill tree. The dodge roll isn't required in all circumstances, but I can't think of a single tough encounter that I could have survived if it wasn't for the extended dodge distance that it brings. I do believe you have iframes while dodging, but if you've watched my God of War video then you know how I feel about the game barring your defensive options for stupid reasons. Encounters against humans are more interesting than those against the wildlife, but all of it gets repetitive the more you play. The big issue with the enemy variety is that most of it went into creating different versions of the same enemy instead of creating more enemies. This means you'll be fighting the same wildlife over and over throughout the course of the game with the only real difference being their stats and appearance. Adding a couple of spiky points to an enemy and buffing the shit out of all their stats isn't intuitive enemy design, and I hope this issue comes from a lack of resources instead of a lack of competency. There's also the issue I wasn't really able to fit in with everything else. Enemies are tethered to their general area and will de-aggro if you walk away from them. This fully regains their health and causes them to run back to where they were originally standing. This can be frustrating when you accidentally cross over the imaginary line that completely resets the encounter, and everybody involved regains their health except for for you. Thankfully, this doesn't respawn the enemies that already died. There are many more issues that were too minor to really comment on or remember by the time I finished the game, so bear in mind that this is not an all-inclusive list of the game's problems. With that being said, let's go ahead and move on from gameplay and take a closer look at the game's factions. The different players in Greedfall's world all have a similar problem. They read like a summary you'd find on the wiki. There's not pages of depth and lore between these organizations, they're as one-dimensional as they can get. It feels like the writers jotted down a brief concept for each faction to represent and never tried to deviate from that one defining characteristic. They're shallow, borderline uninteresting, and insufferable. And before we get too far into that discussion, let's go ahead and talk about the reputation system. The system is pretty basic and feels extremely underdeveloped. Completing side quests will usually result in a reputation bonus, but you can also get them through your decisions and how you treat the members of these factions. You can lower your reputation to the point of turning a faction hostile towards you, but from what I've seen, this has literally no impact on how they actually treat you. In fact, it's actually more difficult to make a faction hate you for longer than 5 minutes than it is to get every faction to love you. It's just a matter of how much time you're willing to spend grinding out side quests. I actually made it a goal to try and make everybody hate me on my second playthrough, and I can safely say that it is impossible to achieve. Even if you do everything in your power to be a total piece of shit, just the act of progressing through the main story will knit you enough reputation to make at least one of the factions nice to you. This feels stupid, and just like so many other things in the game, it shouldn't exist if it isn't going to serve a specific purpose. With that brief discussion out of the way, let's get into the factions themselves. Almost every problem I have with Greedfall's story is a lack of exploration that the world was given. This can be seen in the factions, companions, quests, and even the bigger choices that will shock you with how little they actually change the story. There are a few consequences that genuinely make sense given the context, but I can only think of one situation like this within the main story, which is far too low for a world with this much potential. Spiders has created a world that is so interesting that it could stand to rival the very games that inspired it, and instead of diving into the ocean of potential that a world like this has, they proceeded to do nothing with it. They made the most impressive outline that I've seen from an RPG of this type in years, decided that the surface level details were enough, and then wrote a story that isn't half as interesting as everything that was lost. The saddest part is that it probably could have worked if more attention was given to the players on the field. Think of your favorite work of fiction. It doesn't matter if it's a game, a film, or a book. Now think of all the things that make it stand out to you. The different nations or factions, their motivations, and the conflicts that come from when they interact with each other. Maybe they fight over a difference of ideals or beliefs, maybe they're fighting for resources, or maybe they're just assholes. Now imagine that same universe without any of the nuances involved in their conflicts. 
Take the number one belief of each of the groups and make it the only motivation behind their actions. And I mean the only one. Once you trim away the details, these groups become much less interesting, and the entire world suffers as a result. This is the problem that Greedfall has. I think I've rambled on long enough about this issue, so let's start off by talking about the factions and then move on to the characters, including the companions. There are six factions in this game. Three nations, two guilds, and the tribal natives of Tier for D. Each companion belongs to one of these factions. Let's start with some of the better examples and work our way into the worst ones. First, we have the Bridge Alliance. This is a group of smaller nations that came together to form a greater whole. Although, don't think for a second that there will be any sort of diversity between the individual cultures that are associated with the Alliance. That would be too interesting. The Bridge is only about one thing, science. They mostly consist of doctors and alchemists, and you'll learn in the prologue that they don't shy away from torturing and experimenting on patients to further their goals. Bill Nye would fit in well. Not everybody agrees with these practices, but this is the main issue you'll be confronting throughout the course of the game. Next, we have Teleme. They're a theocracy built on the teachings of St. Matthias, passed down by his disciple, St. Lucius. The religious laws are enforced by the Ordo Luminous, simply called the Inquisitors, and I think the name speaks for itself. They are actively at war with the Bridge Alliance over their intolerance of those who don't follow their beliefs and their unwillingness to stop burning heretics at the stake. They are actually incredibly similar to the Church of the Eternal Fire from The Witcher, with the main difference being that they actually use magic. Other than that, everything else is the same. They believe that all of life's problems is a result of the heresy of the non-believers, and if everybody followed their religion, then there would be no more sickness or suffering of any kind. You learn in the prologue that the religious zeal is so strong that they are willing to openly kill those they don't agree with, even if what they're saying is actually true to their own religious texts. Not everybody agrees with these practices, but this is the main issue you'll be confronting throughout the course of the game. The final nation is the one you belong to, the Congregation of Merchants. You actually can't learn much about the Congregation because Desarde is supposed to already know everything about its practices, so the writers figured the name alone should suffice and didn't give you a single NPC to speak about its history and greater lore. The most you'll ever learn is that they're allied with both Teleme and the Alliance and are thus neutral in their conflict. The lack of information makes it very difficult to understand exactly what the Congregation is about, how they ended up as a monarchy, and what the extent of your power as the Legate actually is is. All we know about your duties as Legate is that you are the chief diplomat, although the amount of legal authority you flex throughout the course of the game only serves to muddy the waters even more. Before you go thinking the congregation has it right, you'll learn with this next faction that they're just as rotten as everybody else. This brings us to the first guild, the Nantes, which I consider to be the most fleshed out as far as the continental factions go. As the name suggests, they're a guild of sailors who have monopolized the industry through the use of an unknown form of magic that has allowed them to become masters of their craft. They rely heavily on their secrets to maintain their status and lend their services to every nation on the continent, although they seem to have a closer relationship with the congregation because of their trade-heavy society. Before you go thinking the knots are alright, it's revealed that they have a very questionable method of recruitment. In exchange for their services, and in order to keep the guild full of fresh recruits, all children born on knot ships legally belong to them. There used to be a policy between the congregation and knots where children were given even if they weren't born at sea, although this has since relaxed as time went on. As of now, children are only given under the terms of certain contracts, seemingly only those that use their services for years or decades. You learn more about this in the prologue. The Knots are reluctant to accept recruits who seek them out on their own accord out of fear that their secrets will be revealed to the other nations, although you will learn that they are willing to bring them under their fold under these circumstances, even if they remain paranoid that these recruits will betray them at any moment. Not everybody agrees with these practices, no actually yeah, basically all of them and many from the congregation agree with the concept of ripping children from their families and forcing them into a long life of scrubbing the deck. The next guild is the least explored faction in the game, the Coin Guard. I have the most to say about the guard because they make the least amount of sense, so allow me to temporarily suspend the condescending tone and get a little serious for a moment. The Coin Guard are the largest and most powerful mercenary group in Greedfall's world, and just like the congregation, there isn't an NPC you can speak with in order to learn more about them. Everything I know comes from context clues given in-game, and I can confidently say that this faction makes absolutely no sense. The Coin Guard, as you'll learn soon enough, are employed by every nation in the game. Initially, I thought that only the Congregation employed them, and I think that's the way it should have been. A nation that relies so heavily on free trade employing an entirely privatized military company is a neat detail, but the neutrality from the neighboring conflicts takes this one step further. The Congregation wouldn't need to worry about the aggression from the other nations, but assets still need to be protected from criminals, so the Coin Guard functions as a reliable and flexible force that can guarantee they aren't completely defenseless. 
Contracting a group of fighters that already possess the skills you need is much easier than trying to train them in yourself, and these contracts can easily be renegotiated should they need to increase or scale back their protection. This sounds pretty interesting, right? Well, let me remind you that this is how the faction should operate, but this isn't how it is in the game. Recall how I said the coin guard is hired by every nation in the game, but the extent of their duties is unknown. For the congregation, we know that Kurt was assigned as your royal master of arms. He trained both you and Constantine, who's your cousin and the heir to the throne as Prince Dorsey's only son. Why he's still a prince if he's both married and the leader of the nation, I couldn't tell you, but that's not the point. The coin guard must be known for their prowess in combat if they are sought out by the royal family to provide combat training, but it's not clear how they function in the other nations. Maybe they do something similar for the other governments and are hired to train their troops to be more combat efficient, or maybe they only do guard duty to protect their goods and resources. The point is, there's no way to tell because you're not given any information. The worst part about the guard is that it's heavily implied that they make up the standing army of all three nations, two of which are at war with each other. As far as Tier 4D is concerned, this is literally how they operate, and it's never explicitly said that this is only how it works on the island. The coin guard all follow the orders of a single commander, even the various regiments that serve the three nations, so it's either a massive oversight or a testament to how under-explained this faction is that they would actually fight a war against each other just because the other nations paid them to do so, and yet this is literally how they seem to function. None of the nations are explicitly said to have a state military apart from the coin guard, and if they do, then this causes even more problems. The reason that a privatized military works for the congregation is because their nation revolves around trade, and it suits their needs the best. If Teleme and the Bridge Alliance have their own standing armies, which I think we can all agree that they probably do since it would make no sense for them not to, then why would they pay the coin guard to protect their cities on Tier 4D? I know what you're probably thinking. Their militaries are busy fighting a war and this would be a safer and more secure option. The issue with that theory is that both the ambassadors for Teleme and the Bridge Alliance don't really mention the coin guard specifically when you ask them about their conflict. The Teleme ambassador does say that they're fighting on every front, but the Alliance ambassador outright says that a direct conflict on Tier 4D is inevitable. Let me remind you that both regiments of the coin guard on Tier 4D answer to the same commander, so what is the extent of their power versus the governors on the island? These details aren't just conflicting, they outright strangle each other, and clear lines needed to be drawn about the coin guard and the individual nation's authority. There is no answer to these questions because the writers didn't actually think about this faction when they created them. The lack of information about the coin guard hurts their believability, which makes some very interesting points later in the story carry no weight as a result. Moving on, let's talk about the natives of Tier 4D. These are by far the most fleshed out faction in the game, if only because you spend the most amount of time exploring their culture and beliefs in the main story. They're the only faction in the game that isn't 100% comprised of assholes, although they do have their fair share. Even then, the game makes it very clear that they're justified in being assholes because every other faction is actively making their life hell. Even so, the natives are so lacking in nuance, and you don't have to play the game to have a general understanding of their social structure. Seriously, I want you to think of the first thing you think of when you hear the word native and keep it in mind over the course of the video. Odds are, you got at least 60% of their culture correct on a stereotype alone. That's not to say there isn't anything interesting about them, but a majority of it is very basic and cliche. Despite there being at least 5 or 6 different native tribes, your reputation is tied to all of them at once. This isn't too bad since they do have a centralized government in their high king, but it still feels weird that your reputation with one tribe who wants to make peace and trade with the colonists will take a hit because you killed some of the rebels who are actively fighting against them. It's also worth mentioning that the natives are very obviously the writer's favorites as they're treated like the victim in almost every situation. I think you can see the problem with these factions. They're all very simple and fit a certain stereotype. You have the money-loving capitalists who quite literally sell their children for more profit. You have the pragmatic scientists who won't shy away from human experiments. You have the zealous theocrats who want to both save your soul and kill you at the same time. And you have the naturalist tribes who have to put up with the big bad colonists. In this one sentence, I have described 90% of this game's conflicts. There may be more details about the situations, but the entire game maintains the singular face of these factions. The exceptions are the coin guard, for reasons I already explained, and the knots, since they seem like the only faction I would consider wholly original. That's not to say these factions are inherently bad just because they're simple. The Elder Scrolls literally has the Fighters Guild, the Thieves Guild, and the Mages Guild, and nobody complains there. 
However, these all exist to serve a specific character archetype and give the player a sense of belonging within it. Greedfall doesn't do this since Desarde will always be Desarde regardless of his fighting style. The game could have gotten away with having simple factions that were well written, but they're really not. You get to see so little of the Alliance's structure and beliefs outside of being overbearing science nerds that I actually felt like half of the side content was missing until I stumbled upon the last few quests. And now I feel like a fourth of the side content is missing. This isn't even bringing up how little the factions interact with each other. That's not to say there isn't some faction crossover, but it usually involves Teleme or the Alliance starting shit with the Knots and the Natives. There are very few instances where any of the colonial factions butt heads with each other, and that's probably why this game feels so pro-native. They're the only group you see fighting with everybody else on the island, and I can only think of a handful of situations where they were actually in the wrong. Even then, the game shies away from punishing them as much as you do every other faction in the game, because at the end of the day, they were only trying to defend their home. There's only one instance of two tribes fighting each other, and it's in a side quest that you could easily ignore since the prerequisite is so insignificant. Even if you do complete it, you'll never see something like that happen again unless you count one instance in the middle of Act 2. This lack of faction interaction can also be seen in the companions, so let's move on to that discussion. You're probably wondering how much more I could possibly have to say about the companions considering everything I brought up when discussing dialogue, but I think they represent some of the shortcomings of the game's writing. I already mentioned earlier how your companions rarely ever fight with each other, so I won't repeat that point here, but another big problem is how they don't properly represent the factions that they come from. The lack of conflict between these characters mostly comes from the fact that not a single one of them agrees with or is willing to justify the cruel actions of their nations, except for Siora and Vasco. And of course the native companion is going to justify the actions of the natives when they're actively being kidnapped and tortured by Teleme and the Alliance. The Knots hardly need justification for their actions since it's already a long-standing tradition to take custody of their children born on their ships, so this doesn't really reflect negatively on Vasco's character either. These characters are too clean, they get along too well, and it misses out on a chance for some more interesting interactions between them. I think the reason for this is similar to one scene in Mass Effect Andromeda. Since these characters are romanceable, the developers didn't want to run the risk of making them unlikable out of fear that the player would miss out on their poorly animated sex scenes, although Griefall at least keeps their clothes on so you don't need to see anything too awkward. This would also explain why the only character you really see do anything shady is Petrus, and even that sorts itself out too quickly and basically goes nowhere. This also shows some awkwardness in the game's romance options. It's easy to believe that these people would like you based on your actions and not just your words, but that's not actually true. You can do everything in your power to screw over the various factions, but so long as you complete their loyalty quest and exhaust their handful of side conversations, they automatically decide that they're in love with you. I don't think these companions should have been romanceable at all if they weren't going to make it seem realistic, but since Bioware games have romanceable companions, Greedfall needed to have them too. Creative integrity be damned. So we're already pretty deep into this video, and I haven't even introduced the game's cast. I would mark this as a spoiler warning, but there isn't much to spoil, or at least there's nothing extremely interesting about these characters that I think you should experience yourself. As I said a moment ago, each companion in this game represents their faction without representing their dark side. Kurt is a captain of the Coin Guard who undergoes some serious character development over the course of the game, and he knows how to hold his own pretty well in combat. Vasco is a knot who doesn't change near as much, but is still one of my favorite companions due to the fact that he is the only one who keeps his damn mouth shut and doesn't get you into trouble with the members of other factions. But he's worthless in a fight. Petrus is a smooth-talking Teleme bishop who is meant to act as your spiritual father, but really just ends up getting you in trouble with the natives. He's even more worthless in a fight. Afra is the Alliance scientist whose entire personality is being from the Alliance and being a scientist. Her character is weird because she's set up to be this badass, roguish scientist, but her effectiveness in combat can be boiled down to missing shots with her rifle and shouting a warning every time she throws a grenade. Siora is the emissary of her native clan and one of the more interesting characters in my opinion, mostly because she actually represents the natives properly and feels like the writers knew exactly what they wanted her to be. She is Desarde's counterpart on Tier for D, a diplomat who is trying to negotiate the needs of her people while not being afraid to stand and fight when the situation calls for it. She's also actually useful in combat due to her ability to heal your entire party, although just like every other combat quip in this game, you'll get sick of hearing it by the end of the game assuming you're one of the 5% of players who make it that far. Notice how I pointed out who couldn't hold their own in a fight. The reason for that is because if you're not constantly upgrading your companion's gear, then they're going to get bodied. Even if you do pile expensive equipment onto them, they're still likely to get clapped by the wildlife because of how much damage some mobs do. 
Even so, I don't think companions even really contribute to combat. There's a message in the loading screen that says how each companion fits a certain fighting archetype and you should specialize your party according to your needs. This isn't actually true. Companions definitely fit an archetype, but you'll never be required to specialize your party. Kurt is supposed to be a hard-hitting tank, but since he's a melee fighter, he's just going to get knocked down repeatedly. Petrus has the same problem, except he's a magic fighter, so his damage output is lower than my economics test score when my instructor decided to make the exam questions as far removed from the review questions as humanly possible. Vasco's main purpose in combat seems to be putting a bit of poison on his blade to add a damage over time effect before getting knocked unconscious after three swings. Afra just stands still shooting enemies, once again calling into question why firearms weren't given their own unique fighting style. Then there's Siora, who can hold her own surprisingly well due to her ability to heal the entire party. The most amount of specializing you'll be doing is finding out who you want to serve as Siora's meat shield. Even then, you'll be doing 90% of the damage in most fights. So, at the end of the day, Siora is the only companion who frequently represents the faction that she comes from, she's the only one worth having in a fight if you don't want to handle basically every encounter solo, and she's also your go-to source for most of the native's culture. Why do I feel like this character received preferential treatment? Either she was created earlier in development before spiders ran out of funding for their project, or they have an extreme bias towards the natives. Honestly, it's probably both. Well, that's Great Falls cast. It's no Mass Effect 2 or Fallout New Vegas, but it's definitely better than Fallout 4 or Skyrim's companions. I think that comparison really speaks to a lot of things about Greedfall. The best you can really say is, at least it's better than X. I'll give spiders this much, they're great at topping the exceedingly low bars set by other games, but that's probably not the basis you want to be judging a game by. I think I've exhausted just about every topic divorced from the main story by this point. All of this has just been me laying the groundwork for what's to come. I have even more to say about these factions and characters in that section, and I have this nagging suspicion that it's going to be even longer because of it. Actually, I've already written the script. I know it's going to be longer because of it. We're not quite ready to hop into the story just yet, but this is where the spoilers begin. If anything I've said sounds perfect for you, for some ungodly reason, if it sounds perfect for you, then I think you should go ahead and give Greedfall a try. The Gold Edition is out now with a new expansion, and there's a possibility that you could like this game. For everybody else, of which I imagine there are far more of you than the former, Let's talk about some quest structure. I figure that Greedfall's story and side content are where most players are going to start checking out. Judging by the fact that not even a quarter of the Steam players got to the end of the first act, it's impossible to deny that a lot of people didn't like this game's plot. This isn't a surprise to me, because this game's main story is the weakest part of it. You're probably wondering how I could think that when I clearly enjoyed the game on my first playthrough, but that's because the main story cannot stand on its own without the side content. And there is so much side content in this game that I didn't actually do the quest to recruit Afra until nearly 15 hours into my first playthrough. And this is just one of three introductory quests in the main story. Because of the story's non-linear design, I was able to progress without ever completing this quest, but even that's secondary to the sheer amount of time I spent running around San Mateus and busting the Ordo Luminous for burning jaywalkers at the stake. The problem is that if you don't engage in the game's side content, and I really can't understate just how much time you'll be spending running around this damn island if you decide to do it all, you'll run into several glaring issues. For starters, not completing enough of these quests means that you won't gain enough reputation with the various factions, which can lock you out of getting the best ending. I put that in quotes because the only thing that really changes are the ending slides, which work well in a game like Fallout but feel very out of place in Greedfall. I'll talk more about the endings when I get to them, but just know that if you want everything to work out for the better, you need to complete every side quest and make the obvious morally superior choices within these quests. I'll also say that the very fact that there is a best ending kind of undercuts many things about the game's story. I think the fact that everything can work itself out in the end feels a bit contrived. Too many times the writers don't understand that Tier 4D is a several months voyage from the mainland, and what you do here shouldn't have such significant ramifications. There are only a handful of exceptions to this, but for the most part, I don't think it makes sense that you could fundamentally change much of a nation's structure based on something that takes place so far away. I'll point out instances like this when I come across them, but for now, try and keep this in mind as we go through the different things you do here on the island. I am going to be covering all of the game major side quests, so you'll be happy to know that most of them are fairly interesting if you care at all about Greedfall's world. That being said, not every side quest in the game is the same level of quality. There's a notorious side quest in this game that is quite possibly the worst design side quest that I and many others have ever played in an RPG. Before the expansion came out, which I might add, it released the same night I was about to drop this project and move on to something else, 
This side quest is the only one that gleans any information on the congregation and how they operate. The expansion does shed a little more light on the subject, but I don't think it revealed as much as I would have liked. Without wasting everybody's time and covering the quest beat by beat, allow me to summarize. You take a quest from a native who says that the congregation is preventing them from replanting trees from a section of the forest that they're using for their logging operations. After investigating, you find out that tensions are high because some of the loggers were killed, and you learn that they died from eating some poisoned meat that the quest giver paid some hunters to bring to them. If this were any other side quest in the game, you would have confronted the man about the murder and that would have been the end of it, but for some reason, Desarde decides that this is beyond his abilities, so you go ask your former professor for help. He tells you to go to the archives to investigate the terms of the contract that was made with the natives. Be advised that Corsillian's office is at the top of the palace, and the archives are in the basement. You find the contract, but Desarde can't understand the legal terminology. So you go visit the former governess for clarification since she's the one who wrote it. She admits that they screwed the natives in this deal, but after learning more about the natives' culture, she has come to regret it and wants to help set things right. You then return to Corsillian to talk about writing a new contract, then you return to the native chief to tell him about the murder and the new terms of their arrangement. This is the end of the first quest, but the one that follows is just a continuation of these events, so it's more than likely that you'll do it at the same time. The chief, Dunkus, informs you that a nearby mine was closed by the congregation because it was on the verge of collapsing. Somebody has resumed operations, and he wants you to shut it down. You arrive at the mine and are denied entry by the guards. They claim this is private property owned by a man named Mayard. You decide to do some snooping and find that he's using the natives as slave labor to operate the mine. If this were any other quest, you'd confront Mayard for his crimes and have him arrested, but Asarde decides that this is beyond his abilities, so you go ask Cressillian for help. He tells you to go to the archives to find the property deed. You do, but Desarde can't understand the legal terminology, so you go ask the former governess for clarification. She tells you that he isn't allowed to use the mine, so you go confront him. Mayard doesn't deny the allegations, but he does try to bribe you. Whenever you refuse, he leaves. Let me reiterate that for a moment. Mayard, a merchant, admits to breaking the terms of his contract and enslaving the natives, tries to bribe a public official and the governor, and you don't arrest him. You just let him go. You then go cry to Corsillian about how he tried to bribe you, and he writes an eviction notice for Maillard. He then tells you that for his crimes against the natives, his punishment is, not prison time, not a public execution, banishment. He jeopardized your fragile alliance with the natives and almost collapsed a mine that would have destroyed the entire neighboring region, and he's going to walk away a free man. You travel back to his camp where you confront him with the eviction notice. He decides to try and fight back, so you kill him. You free the slaves and report to Dunkus where Desarde still seems to think that Maillard is going to be banished. I vaguely remember shooting him multiple times, throwing a bomb at him, and looting the pocket change off his corpse. I don't think he's going anywhere. I received this quest 26 hours into the game. Desarde had busted countless conspiracies and operated with almost absolute authority in every situation until now, but the second it comes to the nation that he actually holds such a high position in, he doesn't know what to do. Even the tutorial quest and the prologue weren't this egregious, and I honestly don't understand how this made it into the final version of the game. The reason I took the time to lay this out isn't just to show how badly written this quest is, it's to say this. Almost every quest in Greedfall shares this quest's DNA. Most of them are more interesting and feel less annoying to get through, but you'd be hard-pressed to find a single scripted quest that doesn't have you running around the island talking to people, doing some investigative work, and having the occasional fight. This is even true for the DLC expansion that released two years after the base game. The order of these events will vary, and there are more things that can be added to the mix, like the occasional stealth section, but 99% of the quests fit this formula. The only thing saving them from being boring fetch quests are the stories that they tell. But as you can see with this one, not every quest in the game has something interesting to say. We're almost at the point where we can start talking about the main story, but before we can do that, we need to talk about the prologue. Greedfall's prologue is, in many ways, the best part of the game. You're just unlikely to realize this on your first time through. The quests aren't particularly interesting, but they serve their purpose of introducing you to the main factions and setting up the conflicts that you'll see later in the game, even if what you experience here is the extent of those conflicts. The exception to this is the Coin Guard, which sets up the finale of Act 1 so well in the early game that it stands out in my mind as the most meticulous subplot Greedfall has to offer despite the Coin Guard's lack of believability as a faction. The setup you get for the Alliance and Teleme are still pretty good for their own reasons that I'll get into a little bit later, but they don't have as large of a payoff as the Guard did, even if that payoff does fall a little bit flat at the end. 
Something interesting about the prologue is that it takes place in a city that you'll never come back to. Serene is a wholly unique area that, while not as big as Hikmet or San Mateus, is still impressively large. It was also interesting to see just how much it contrasts from the other cities on Tier 4D. There's an ever-present layer of smog that hangs in the air from the congregation's industrial efforts and the bodies they're burning in the streets to try and combat the plague that runs rampant on the continent. The people here are much less lively, and everybody looks miserable. These details were deliberately placed to help solidify that Serene is not the utopian city of progress that much of the congregation would have you believe. As with a lot of things in this game, these themes don't really lead to a satisfying payoff, but I appreciate how much went into making Serene distinct from the rest of the game, and being given a chance to see a city that you'll be leaving behind does make Tier 4D itself feel a little more open and free, even if most of what you do here doesn't carry over to the rest of the game. The problem with this prologue is that it sets in proper expectations for every other quest that follows it. These side quests offer more solutions to get through them than anything else in the game. There are some quests in the game with multiple solutions, but I can't think of a single one past this point that offers near as many, especially the Alliance side quest. The same could be said for the main story. The number of solutions you have to get through it is impressive, but it becomes apparent once you get to Tier 4D that the only reason you have this many choices is because the prologue was contained enough to support them. Had the game offered this many choices in at least half of the quests you do go Going forward, then I wouldn't be so cynical about my experience with it. But the contrast between the prologue and the rest of the game is so stark that it makes the introduction feel like little more than smoke and mirrors. This is likely why 70% of Steam players finished the prologue and only 26% made it to the big reveal near the end of Act 1. To be fair, there are so many side quests to do in Act 1 that this could be anywhere from 5 to 20 hours of playtime, but I still think the numbers speak for itself. To lose almost three-fourths of your player base before the end of the first act is an achievement on its own, and it makes me wonder how this game received such an enormous amount of praise if so few people got this far, much less 5% of players who actually finished the game. I've done a lot of talking so far, 42 pages in fact, and I think it's finally time to dive into the game's main story. It may seem like I've been trying to drag out this video for as long as possible, but I really do have a lot of thoughts about this game that I'm trying my best to convey in an organized manner. Believe me, I wouldn't want to make Editor Shrimp's life any more difficult than it needs to be. With that said, it's worth mentioning that this is likely going to be the least structured part of the video. There are a lot of side quests in this game, and while I won't be covering all of them, I will be going over companion quests and those that have the greatest impact on the world. Expect me to jump between main story and side content frequently since some things require a little bit of story context in order to make sense. I've done my absolute best to make sure this isn't just one big jumbled mess, but considering that's how I played the game my first time through, don't be surprised if it does feel that way at some points. With all that being said, let's finally get into it. The game begins with character creation in the form of you having your portrait made. It's a little bit awkward how the opening cutscene begins with you as a male and you can just magically change your sex and appearance on the spot. You're then interrupted by a character we've already talked about, Corsillian. He says that your cousin, Constantine, hasn't returned from his night on the town and your voyage to Tier 4D leaves soon. The prince isn't happy about this and Desarde says that he'll find him. You also assure Corsillian that you'll tell the ambassadors of Telemia in the Alliance of your departure, apologize to the artist for leaving your portrait half finished, and start making your way through the palace. If you're anything like me, you'll try to kill one of the NPCs and feel disappointed that they don't respond to your attempts on their life. If you're a functioning individual, then you'll go make your way down to the courtyard where you're introduced to Kurt. He's here to give you a combat tutorial, and if you defeat him, then it lets you skip the more detailed walkthrough. You have a brief discussion where you express your gratitude or disdain towards him coming to Tear for D with you, and then you go tell your mother goodbye. This scene is one of a handful in the entire game where Desarde is allowed to express any true emotion. Even the romance scenes feel considerably weak when compared to this one, or any other scene in the game now that I think about it. His mother is terminally ill with a mysterious plague that is running rampant through the continent called the Malachor, and the sickness has progressed to the point that she is now blind. You learn in this scene that Desarde's father has already died in an unspecified way, and this is the last time he will ever see his mother. She is hopeful that the cure will be found on the island, but she is also aware that she won't live long enough to see it. By the time you arrive on the island, she will already be dead. She then hands you something, which she claims to be a family heirloom, and you leave to catch her voyage. There's something about this scene that stands out to me, and it's something that prevents it from failing in a similar way that other games have. The game isn't really trying to tug on your heartstrings or get an emotional response out of you. It's not overdramatic, and the game doesn't try to make it feel personal. In other words, the game doesn't expect you to care about this character and feel sad about her death. Its purpose is to introduce the concept of the Malachor and show the personal stakes of this mission for Desarde, but the mutual understanding that his mother isn't going to survive means that there doesn't need to be a race against time to find the cure. 
Despite the fact that his mother is dying, the tone of the scene actually isn't somber. She's accepted her fate and ensures that her last moment with her son isn't painful, and she sets him off with high hopes of a better future. It's worth expressing just how good the writers handled this scene so you can see just how poorly they handled almost everything else. You meet up with Kurt where he tells you that he needs your help with something. The commander of the coin guard ordered some supplies to take to Tier 4D, but the merchant is refusing to release them. He wants you to go and persuade him to give up the goods before you leave. This has you bribing him or passing a skill check to convince him to relinquish the supplies, then smuggling them onto Vasco's ship. It doesn't actually matter if you change the logbooks to make it legal because you'll have a follow-up quest for this once you reach Tier 4D. In addition to this quest, there are three others. The Teleme ambassador wants you to track down some heretics who are hiding in the congregation. You learn that they hide hired a smuggler to get them to the Alliance, and after tracking them down, you learn they're not heretics at all, they're just historians. They found an interpretation in some of their texts that displeases the censor, so now they're out for blood. You can either let them go, turn them into Teleme to be executed, or negotiate with the bridge ambassador to grant them amnesty. You then have the choice of lying to the Teleme ambassador or being honest, which will affect your reputation reward. For the next quest, the Alliance Ambassador wants you to arrest a man selling fake miracle potions in the city. You track him down and oust him in front of a crowd whenever he refuses to drink his own product that you acquired. You then follow him to his room in the tavern where he tells you his sob story. He is a legitimate alchemist and a former professor of the academy in the British capital, Al Saad. He discovered that the Academy was torturing and experimenting on their patients in order to find a cure for the Malachor, and he was defamed after he publicly criticized them for it. He then came here and started selling these fake potions that are designed to create a resistance to the plague in those who drink them. He swears that they're harmless in small doses, but he had tested on himself for so long that he can't stomach it anymore. Regardless of what you think, Desarde thinks that he's no better than the Academy for experimenting on people without their knowledge, but you're given the choice to let him live or turn him into the Ambassador. If you let him live, then you either try to smuggle him out of the tavern without being seen or try to disperse the crowd. Both choices offer various ways to go about them, and then you return to the bridge ambassador to confront him about his lies or lie to him yourself. Just like before, this affects your reputation reward. The final quest is given by Vasco. A cabin boy named Jonas has gone missing, and he wants you to investigate to make sure nothing bad has happened to him. You question his friends and learn that he may have been kidnapped. You go investigate, which brings you to a home of a wealthy merchant family, the Fontaines. Mrs. Fontaine tells you that Jonas is her son, and she says that he came home of his own free will, but is being hidden so the Nots can't take him back. You learn from Corsillian that Fontaine must have made a deal with the Nots to give up his son in exchange for their services in his trading business, and then regretted it later. You track him down to one of his warehouses where you convince him to let Jonas go. After freeing him, he tells you that he feels bad for his mother, but the Nots are his true family. You then return to Vasco and are congratulated for a job well done. These side quests introduce you to a number of things. First, they show you that every faction in the game are shitheads, but most importantly, it shows that you won't need to be careful to balance your peace with them. Simply doing things for them is enough to get them to like you, which seems like a missed opportunity, but given how the game ends, I think this is intentional. The side quests also set those improper expectations that I mentioned earlier. No quest in the main game is going to be nearly as detailed as these, and it almost feels like you're being led on because of it. Nothing proves this more than the main quest in Serene, so let's go ahead and move on to that. There are many ways you can find Constantine in the prologue. You can do a little sleuthing and follow the breadcrumbs to his location, you can find some ransom notes posted around town and follow their instructions, or you can just walk there. That last one surprised me since I thought the quest stage wouldn't trigger if I didn't follow the intended path, but the reason this one does is because you're meant to follow the posters. Trying to find the alleged heretics early doesn't work because they don't spawn until you question the smuggler or find his journal revealing their hiding place. Getting Constantine early also unlocks additional dialogue for most of the other quests, and provides an alternate solution to appeasing the angry barkeeper whose furniture is broken from Constantine's drunken night out. Otherwise, you need to fix it yourself or pay him to progress. Nothing else in the entire game is going to have this level of complexity, and it's honestly a real shame. If you follow the main path to try and find Constantine, then you'll quickly be introduced to Captain Vasco. Desarde calls his ship a boat, which is almost as offensive as calling somebody's base a guitar. Vasco points you towards the tavern, and after dealing with a furniture problem, you track down Constantine. From here, you can use your science skill to blow out a weak wall, pay a ransom, or convince the thugs to release him, or just kill them all. Once you're in, you get your formal introduction to this character, and I don't think the term camp is enough to quite express the tone of this scene. 
His demeanor changes the moment Desarde mentions his father, and he heavily implies that the only reason he was appointed governor over the congregation's colony on the island is so he could be rid of him. Desarde assures Constantine that his father loves him, but he remains unconvinced. Then, his demeanor changes again, and he's all of a sudden overjoyed to leave for Tear for D. These mood swings don't feel inorganic, but they do happen incredibly fast to make the whole scene feel like a soap opera. In the game's defense, Constantine is extremely dramatic, so this is completely within character. It just feels off every time I see it. You return with him to Vasco, and if you don't have anything left to do, you make your way to his ship so you can leave for Tear for D. Constantine starts talking about how the island is supposed to have creatures as tall as buildings roaming around, and he heard that the Knots brought one back on one of their ships. Kurt mentions that the Knots aren't that crazy, and five seconds later, a big-ass monster busts out of one of the ships and is crushed by the mast. This doesn't kill it, but it does weaken it enough for you to finish it off without dying in the process. It's honestly not a bad fight, and it's a great exclamation mark to leave at the end of an otherwise slow start to the game. This was the moment that I started really looking forward to the rest of the game. I imagined Tear Freddy crawling with different monsters like some crazier version of where the wild things are. I thought this was just one of an entire species of beasts like this. And you already know where those expectations led. This is one of a small pool of bosses that are going to be recycled repeatedly throughout the course of the game. As you board Vasco's ship and prepare to set sail for Tear for D, you're leaving the most interesting part of this game behind. The things introduced in the prologue, the side quest with multiple solutions and outcomes, the ideas of trying to balance this fragile alliance with the bridge into Leme, the unique boss encounter to top it all off. All these things cease to exist for the majority of the game. Greedfall is a shell of what it just exposed to you, and that is why so few people saw the game to its conclusion. We jump forward in time, presumably several months, and have finally arrived at Tear for D. You're met by a band of mute plague doctors who offer Constantine something to drink, and you're then introduced to Lady Mirage, the former governess. She tells you that the drink is meant to improve your health after a long voyage. Desarde also drinks one, and then Constantine runs off to explore the city. Vasco then approaches you and says that his admiral laid him off. He was ordered to assist you in any way possible, and he's none too happy about it. You make your way to the palace to meet up with Constantine when you're introduced to Siora. She mistakes you for a native and starts speaking German to you, then tells you that she needs to speak with our leader, which would be Constantine. She says that she's the daughter of her clan chief, so Desarde tells the guards to let her through. You're required to take Siora with you for the moment, which means I send Vasco back to the docks to cry over losing his ship. You then meet up with Constantine, where Siora asks for your help in a coming battle between her clan and the Alliance. Something that never stuck out to me until I heard it in another review was that the natives refer to the Alliance as lions, despite not actually having any lions on the island. This isn't their native language, so it doesn't make any sense that they would be able to make that comparison unless we're to believe that they have heard it enough times from the Alliance soldiers to catch on, and seeing as no one else in the game calls them that, I don't think this is the case. What's even funnier is that the expansion introduced a creature that looks exactly like a lion with a different name. So if this canonically exists on the island, then that should have been what the natives refer to it as. Had this new enemy simply been called Lions, I would honestly have just accepted it as a retroactive patchwork to fix this issue. This is relatively minor in the broad scheme of things, but for somebody, this is going to be a death by a thousand cuts situation. Constantine informs Siora that we can't go to war with the Alliance, and Desarde suggests we go try to negotiate a peace treaty. Constantine approves, telling you to take Kurt and anybody else you think might be useful to you. In addition to this, you've been tasked with speaking to the governors of Teleme and the Alliance about their research into the Malachor in hopes that one of them is close to finding a cure. You can do these quests in any order you like, and you can even progress the main story quite a bit without actually getting around to doing them at all, which is why it took me halfway through my first playthrough to recruit Afra. That said, I think it's best to do the Teleme and Alliance quests since they don't push the story as far as Siora's quest does, and the quests aren't time sensitive even though it makes sense that they would be. It took multiple in-game months to find Afra in her group, and the game treats it like everything had just happened. I understand that punishing the player for not getting around to things in a game this large wouldn't be fair, but I think it would have been worth adding a few lines of dialogue to at least acknowledge that you were putting it off. This game already has an impressive amount of reactivity, so this would have just been the cherry on top. You can also pick up a few companion quests at this time, but I'll be saving that discussion until we have a full party, because some of them have multiple stages that take an eternity to get through. Kurt's quest is probably the longest and most detailed, but it also changes the most about the game and makes the most amount of sense. I think it was probably my favorite questline in the entire game, and I wish that everything else was held to the same standard. I eventually ditch Siora in favor of Kurt and Vasco, because first playthroughs are for the boys, and many hours of side questing and exploring later, we finally arrive at Hikmet, the Alliance's colony on Tier 4D. If you have Siora with you when you go to speak with Governor Burren, she'll tell you that it's probably a good idea to leave her behind since her clan is currently at war with them. Should you ignore her and bring her anyways, then she'll have an outburst in the middle of your discussion, which requires you to take either her side or Burren's. 
This will cause you to lose reputation with one or the other. A big problem with this scene is that Byrne isn't aware of Ciora's accusations, and you think that he would question her about it, but he doesn't. I understand that if we were to reveal everything right here, it would completely break the progression of that subplot, but it still does feel a little inorganic that he doesn't even question her about it. That being said, the reactivity of this encounter is very good, and there are at least two other encounters like it that I experienced. Additionally, there will be an interruption in the middle of your conversation by a guard saying that there has been an attack by the rebel natives. You could find a scout outside the Alliance outpost and were given the choice of letting him go or informing the guards of his presence. If you let him go, then the guards were blindsided by the attack. But if you turn them in, then they were much more prepared and didn't suffer as many casualties. This decision doesn't actually change anything, but it is gently showing the player that their decisions matter in a non-punishing way. I'd like to talk about Burns' character now, but I think it'll be more impactful if I go into it later so you can see the issues for yourself. He is definitely my least favorite authority figure in the game, but that's not a flaw of the game, he's just written to be a bumbling idiot. Technically, they all are, but I find the Mother Cardinal and Teleme to be much more tolerable and demonstrate a little more common sense. For now, your meeting with Byrne goes fine enough. He informs you that he had a research team out examining some of the local flora on the island in hopes of discovering a cure for the Malachor, but he hasn't heard back from them for some time. This is a very pressing matter, so it's only natural that I put it off for as long as humanly possible. He also requests that you look into some native attacks on various merchant caravans, many of which were from the congregation. Let's go ahead and start with that one. You begin by questioning the local guard captain, who tells you that the natives are slaughtering the caravanners without mercy. You go question the sole survivor of the latest attack, and he tells you that the natives started off by attacking the goods, but once the merchants started fighting back, they were all killed. You track down the destroyed caravan, where Desarde takes one look around and says, yep, shit's broke. You then search the neighboring area to try and track down the natives, and if you don't have at least one point in science or three points in vigor, then the game politely tells you to go fuck yourself until you invest in one of the game's favorite bottleneck skills. Once you're through, the native sentries here are immediately hostile to you, and after killing them, you walk right up to their leader, where Desarde says, Hello. Don't worry. I come in peace. I only wish to speak to your leader. The native scout from before is here if you let him go, and he tells the leader of the camp that she can trust us. This is presumably at around the same time that the flies found the corpses. The woman with the distractingly large forehead tells you that the Alliance has been kidnapping native villagers, primarily those with a physical bond to the island called Unal Manawi. We'll talk more about them later. They were attacking the caravans in hopes of cutting off all supplies to Hikmet, and she tells you that if the merchants would have run, they would have been spared. The Sarde says that he's willing to help investigate their missing villagers if they stop attacking the caravans. She tells you that this was their last attack, and that their clan are ready to march on Hikmet and free the people themselves. You're then presented with the choice to kill the natives or simply leave, and I take a play out of Geralt's book and let them go. You then return to the captain to tell her about the impending invasion, and that's the end of the quest. We actually won't be following up on this quest until Act 2. I'm not sure if it just takes that long for the events to trigger, or if I just never went to talk to Burn again before the main quest sent me there. For now, let's go ahead and rescue that science team. You track down their camp where you find signs of a battle. One of the researchers kept her distance from the rest of the camp, and you learned from her journal that she was sure that the team was being watched from the swamp. She tried to warn the rest of the team, but they refused to listen to her. You then make your way towards the swamp where some natives tell you that they won't let you take them. I let Siora intervene because I'd already gotten tired of the sausage fest several hours ago, and she's able to convince them to let you rescue the researchers. They tell you to stay away from the main entrance if you want to avoid a fight, and suggest you enter through the side of the camp where there are less guards. Once they leave, you're immediately jumped by the researcher from the journal, Afra. Her first instinct is to kill you, which doesn't work out of course, but she calms down once you mention Burr and sent you. You introduce yourself and your companions, and then get to work trying to save the researchers. You have your choice of walking in the front door and killing every native you come across, or you can take the stealthier route and try to get them out discreetly. The end result is ultimately the same, and you'll be confronted by more natives when you get back to your camp. Once defeated, they'll ask you to spare their lives. Siora urges you not to kill them, saying that they were only fighting in defense of those the Alliance is kidnapping, and the researchers tell you to kill them so that they can't hunt them down in the future. Once you make your choice, you stop to speak with the scientists and talk to them about their research into the Malachor. They said that they've made a discovery, so you all return to Burren to hear about it. Once you're there, the research lady tells you that a woman the natives call the Tierna Hakkadactus, who I will be referring to as Mev from this point forward because that's her name and it's much easier to say, arrived during their captivity and they overheard something about a miracle remedy she created that can supposedly cure anything. 
Following this lead, you need to head back to the camp where you rescued the researchers and speak with its leader to learn more about Mev. This was extremely awkward on my second playthrough because I killed every native in the camp, including the ones that fight you at the end, and my Desarde thought going back was a good idea. This also shows a big flaw in this game's quest design. No matter how badly you fuck over these people, they will always help you regardless. At least in evil Desarde's case, the natives at least tried to kill us when I returned, and he didn't even pretend that a fight was avoidable with their leader. I am fully committed to finding this cure even if violence must be employed. If you avoided slaughtering the natives, then you're given an opportunity to explain your case and win them over. If not, then you just kick their ass until they tell you what you need to know. Although Desarde still says that he's going to keep the location of their camp a secret. I like to see this as him still clinging on to some semblance of diplomacy, but the reality is they'd have to change too many quests going forward if you were allowed to execute Darren here. She tells you where you can find Mev, so you head to the village where you're told by her assistant that you can't be trusted, and he won't tell you where she's going until you do more side quests. You can't tell him to fuck off and go find him yourself because she hasn't actually spawned in the world yet, so even if you know where to go, you still can't skip this part. The side quests are mundane busy work that aren't even worth going over, and after you've done two of them, the assistant will tell you where you can find Mev. No matter who you bring with you, at least one of your companions screws it up and causes her to leave. You kill her pet lizards and follow her to a large door that you can't open. You have to ask Sierra for help, so the devs were kind enough to put a campsite nearby so you can speak to her. She tells you that the door will only open if you provide the right seed on the altar, but since you don't know which seed is needed, you need to go back and speak with the assistant. Something I love about this dialogue is that there's a speech check where you try to convince him to help you open the door, and yet the only other dialogue option with no skill related to it progresses the quest anyways. Speech checks don't reward XP in this game, so I have no clue why this was even included. It was a waste of the developer's time and money to have these extra lines of dialogue recorded for literally no reason. You convince him to explain how the door works, and he warns you that the path leads to a place where a Nodag lives. It's explained to you that the Nodag are natives whose bond to the earth is so strong that they transform into the various bosses that you find out in the world, and they act as guardians to the island. You then proceed to snoop around Mev's house, which leads you to an area where you can find more seeds for the altar. You use this to open the door, then pass through a cave to get to the clearing where Mev fled to. Once you arrive, you see that a bridge assassin got here ahead of you, and he gets gored by a Nodag before he gets a chance to kill her. This starts a fight against the creature, and it ends with Desarde putting it down with a pistol, just like the one in the prologue. He tells Mev that he didn't want to fight them when the assassin shoots her in the back. He explains that he was sent to capture her so he could learn about their bond to the island and use it to find a cure for the Malachor. He then says that he's going to kill you, and after kicking his ass, you have a choice of letting him live or executing him here. On my good playthrough, I killed him, and on my bad one, I let him leave. You might think that sounds backwards, but I'll explain my reasoning when we reach the end of the game. You bring Mev back to her house and task Siora with healing her. She attacks you whenever she wakes up, and Desarde explains that he was manipulated by the Alliance under the guise of finding a cure for the Malachor. She calms down after hearing this and explains that the remedy you're referring to is used to help the natives that the Alliance is kidnapping. Those who return are in constant pain from the experiments performed on them. You then learn about Enon Milfrictamen, which is explained as a god of the island that protects them. She says that the crimes of the colonizers are enraging it, and that it's possible the Malachor is a result of its anger. At this point, you're expected to go speak with Bar about the assassination attempt, and this is one of the few times the game trusts you to do something without a quest marker. If you do, then he says that the spy was never ordered to attack you, and if you let him live, then he's nowhere to be found. You then explain that the remedy was a bust, and Burren apologizes for wasting your time. This is the end of the Alliance side of the investigation, so all that's left to explore is Teleme's side of things. I have mixed feelings about Teleme as a faction. They're just as bad as the Alliance in almost every way, but they're also much more fleshed out, so it's hard for me not to like them more as a part of Greedfall's world. It's a shame, then, that the religious zealots who torture and kill heretics archetype feels so overused in video games that it's not even interesting anymore. The themes behind factions like these always feel the same, so the entire concept feels completely unoriginal by this point. In Greedfall's defense, this is about the same quality of writing as everything else in the game, so the shallow themes fit the setting much more than they do in other games, which is by no means a compliment to this game. The reason I'm saying all this now is because the first thing you witness when you make it to San Mateus is watching this man, Inquisitor Aloysius, burn a Nodag at the stake as he murders a captured native for refusing to denounce their gods. He then walks over to you and tries to start shit over your birthmark, which is identical to those that the native healers have, and demands that you explain yourself. Can I just point out how much I love that Desarde stands his ground against bullshit like this? They could have easily made him another whipped man too scared to talk back against authority, but he's surprisingly brazen when pushed. The mark on my face is by no means impure. You are walking on thin ice and are close to committing a grave diplomatic error. 
Aloysius asks if you believe in their faith, to which you have the option to say yes, no, or pass a speech check where you warn him that continued aggression could lead to a war between Teleme and the congregation. I've passed this speech check on both playthroughs, but I believe Aloysius will attack you if you answer no. And honestly, after what you just witnessed, has anybody looked at this man and answered yes? I mean, this isn't a radical minority group we're talking about. It's a state-sanctioned organization with strong political ties. And we saw in the prologue that they're not the only ones quick to resort to murder when they disagree with you. I understand that this group is written to be like the average Twitter user, but Desarde is way too open-minded to hold to their faith, even on a Ruin Everybody's Tuesday Afternoon playthrough. Moving on, you head into the Governor's Palace where you're introduced to our next crew member, Petrus. After the display outside, you'd be forgiven if you don't particularly want to take him with you at this time. His main purpose seems to offer a friendly face in an otherwise antagonistic faction, but you can never speak with him about his faith or nation, so this purpose ultimately falls flat. At the very least, you'll be tempted to keep him around because of his voice actor alone. I didn't realize how much I appreciated his actor until I heard him months later while watching somebody stream Dark Souls 3. I'm on my way to New Serene as an ambassador to the new governor. Your Lady Yuri is Lord of Hollows. No bell tolls. And yet, you've slipped into the painting. You decide to take him with you, or rather Desarde does, and then proceed to meet with the Mother Cardinal, Cornelia. They've decided that the Malachor is a curse that was cast on humanity as punishment for a local native cult worshipping a demon. Petrus confirms that there is demonic activity in the region, and she asks that you and Constantine assist them with their investigation, as the eradication of this cult is the only way to stop the Malachor. Once you're done rolling your eyes, you return to Constantine to introduce Petrus, where Desarde comments that he doesn't look well. Constantine shrugs it off, saying that it must be the change in diet and you report your findings from the other governors. Since the bridge is already at war with the natives, and the inquisitors are less than kind to anybody they deem is a heretic, Constantine advises that you proceed with the investigation with caution to avoid straining the congregation's relationship with the natives. At this point, you can go investigate the cult or explore some of Telemi's side content. And since this video is impossible to keep organized, let's take a detour and do that. Teleme probably has the most side content in the game if you don't consider the natives as a single faction. They probably have more side quests overall, it's just split up by the various tribes with their own ideals and slightly different culture. The sheer amount of content Teleme has makes the bridge feel unfinished by comparison, and it definitely hurts their contribution to the world as a whole. I won't be going into great detail about every single quest Teleme has, but I will briefly touch on the ones that aren't required by the main story. In addition to another quest where you learn that the Ordo Luminous is kidnapping natives to try and forcefully convert them to their faith, this one is one that I consider Teleme's main faction questline. These are quests that fully commit to exploring the faction's background and expanding on their place in the world. At least, that's how they're presented. In reality, they're only really exploring the problem we were exposed to in the prologue and have seen repeatedly throughout the game up until this point. In Teleme's case, we will be investigating the origin of their religious beliefs. Should you return to the Mother Cardinal at a point during the story, then she'll pull you aside and ask a favor of you. Teleme has long believed that Tirfordi is the island that was referenced in the teachings of St. Lucius, who was the disciple of St. Matthias. I touched on this briefly briefly earlier, but I didn't actually explain much about their faith. St. Matthias is Greedfall's equivalent of Jesus, and St. Lucius would be more akin to Peter. Matthias lived out his days on the island when Lucius returned to the continent to spread his teachings, and it was through these teachings that Teleme was founded upon, as well as their discovery of magic. Teleme knows very little about Matthias aside from what Lucius wrote about him, so being on the island where he spent his life encouraged them to start trying to find the locations that Lucius wrote about. By following in Matthias' footsteps, they were able to recreate a village they called Eden, which was supposedly a perfect community that Matthias Matthias lived in and is now full of theologians and converted natives. In this new Eden, they uncovered more teachings that were previously undiscovered. The tablets were stolen, and the Mother Cardinal thinks it could be by some of the other natives who reject Teleme, and who can blame them. She wants you to go negotiate with them to see if the tablets can be retrieved, so that's what we do. There's a lot of walking around and speaking with people in this quest, so I'll save everybody the time and summarize. The theologians essentially walked into this native camp and claimed ownership of it, then got to work trying to convert the residents. This, of course, involved torture whenever they would refuse. The clan chief ultimately decided that he was going to lie and say he believes in order to prevent them from massacring the village, and the younger natives decided to leave instead. You also learn that one of the theologians, Brother Virgil, doesn't actually care about the tablets being stolen and says that he believes they were a forgery. He also happened to be on duty whenever they were stolen, and the building they were held in only has one way in or out. 
You eventually learn that some younger natives stole them in order to get back at Toleme for stealing their home, and the mother of one of the exiles begs you not to kill him. They're pretty easy to sneak around, and the mother rewards you if you spared her son's life. You bring the tablets back to the theologians, and that's the entire quest. Just like with the Alliance, we'll be coming back to this quest later in the game. I'd like to go through the entire thing now, but I'm doing the bridge quest in chunks, so I may as well split this one up too. With that done, let's do some cult investigation. You speak with Sister Ephesia at the camp, and she tells you that she was unable to glean any information on the native beliefs. After a while, the natives just stopped talking to her, so she wants you to go investigate. You start off by speaking with Durdra, the clan chief. You're given a list of questions to ask, but she'll cut you off after a handful and refuse to speak with you. You then go speak with the clan wiseman, and he also turns you away, basically saying that the only reason you're questioning people is to confirm your own biases, and that you won't accept any of the answers they have to give. Seeing as this entire investigation exists because Teleme is paranoid about anything that doesn't pertain to their doctrine, I find it very hard to be mad with either of these people. I'm actually surprised that more native clans in this game aren't like this towards you. You'll eventually meet one of the villagers who will speak with you, but she'll only answer your questions if you answer hers. She's friendly enough, so I've never had a problem working with her here, but just as before, you can only ask two questions before she ends the conversation, and it's not enough to get the information you need. You then move on to the final villager who'll speak with you, and you learn that Ephesia tried to break into his house and follow him into the woods at one point. Once you've exhausted your dialogue with him, you return to Ephesia to tell her that you haven't been able to learn anything. She then chooses now to tell you that she was suspicious of the man you spoke with last, and that you should focus your investigation on him. I'm not sure why she didn't tell us this from the start. I'd give it a pass if she said she was trying to avoid actions that could anger the natives further, but she doesn't, so it just comes off as the game unnecessarily wasting your time. This is actually a big problem that this game has where it splits up important information between two or three different NPCs. This makes sense from a realism standpoint since nobody has all the information you need, but it can also make the quest feel unnecessarily padded with the number of people you have to speak with. You follow the man after dark to see where he goes. If you get spotted, then you'll be forced to kill him, and you follow the road to see where it leads. This brings you to a giant tree where Desarde has a strange vision. Then you need to solve a puzzle where you interact with different stones that have pictures on them. Desarde will recount the vision in more detail if you speak with one of your companions, and what he says is the key to moving forward. Once you do, you see the natives performing a ritual that causes a tree inside to start speaking Spanish. Whatever it says gets the natives all riled up, and then you leave to ask Deirdre about what you saw. You lie to her by saying that you part took in the ritual you saw, which she doesn't believe because she's not an idiot. You have the choice of threatening to share what you learned with Teleme to get her to talk, or you can pass a speech check. If you fail the speech check, you need to fight some of her warriors to gain enough respect for her to speak with you. If Siora is with you, these options are bypassed since she convinces Deirdre to help. Once you get her to talk, she tells you that what you saw is just one of nature's many faces, and the ritual was to summon strength to fight off the colonizers. She points you in the direction of where you might find another one of the faces so you can speak with it. You're not allowed to tell Sister Ephesia anything that you've learned or even lie by saying that the trail has gone cold. You're better off forgetting that she even existed. You'll never be confronted by the Mother Cardinal for abandoning the investigations, because its entire premise was nothing more than a plot device to be discarded at the moment it loses all relevance. Those of you who have played the game probably didn't even notice this because we're never directed to speak with Sister Ephesia again. Your next objective is to head to a swamp, speak with a hermit who takes entirely too long to explain the next puzzle, then proceed to solve said puzzle. Doing so summons another Nodig, which is either your first or second mandatory encounter with one depending on which questline you did first. After killing it, the hermit confronts you and starts shouting that you're a murderer. He says that Enol Mil Frichtemann will kill all the colonizers. If you have Siora with you, then she does all the expositing, but if you don't, then the hermit angrily explains everything to you. We already talked about the Nodig during the Alliance section, so there's no point in repeating it here. You return to Durdra and accuse her of trying to have you killed, and she doesn't deny it, but she does congratulate you for not dying. She also swears you to secrecy on the things you've learned, and that's the end of it. You can't retaliate against her, not because it would be out of character for Desarde, but because it would break future quests down the line. You just have to accept the fact that she sent you to your death, and move on. Both paths of this investigation led you to the same conclusion, and on Mil Frichtemann, the god of the island, is either responsible for the Malachor or knows how to cure it. At this point, you can return to Constantine about everything you've learned, where you see that he's coming down with an illness. I am certain that is nothing to worry about. You tell him about Enol Mil Frichtemann, and Sierra tells you where you can meet a man who might be able to get you in contact with him. You can go there now, but you will be refused entry because you're not a member or representative of the Native Council. Until you can get a sponsorship from a clan chief, this quest needs to be put on hold. You think that you could go speak with Durdra or one of the other chiefs involved in a few side quests, Ullman, but you can't. Siro's quest is the actual way to progress the first act of the game, so it's probably about time that we get around to negotiating that ceasefire. 
Sierra's quest is really one of those things that should be time sensitive, but aren't for some reason. She comes to you asking for help because her mother is about to lead her clan to war against the Alliance, and yet you're allowed to dick around doing literally anything else for months before finally getting around to it. This issue isn't specific to Greedfall. This can be seen in almost any open world game that tries to create a sense of urgency in their stories. The reason that Greedfall is such an egregious example is because of the number of times that this tactic is employed, and how they do it for two quests consecutively. Realistically, choosing the save Afro Science team instead of helping Sierra here should have tangible consequences for how much time you wasted, but instead they just sit there frozen in time until you decide you're ready to move on. This is one of those criticisms that don't have a clear solution. If all urgency was removed from the story, then it would be too boring, but telling the player that each faction's respective worlds are on fire kind of discourages you from taking your time. Not that there's much worthwhile exploration in this game anyways. This quest isn't really that long compared to the others that we've looked at, but it does progress the main story quite a bit. You can actually reach the end of the first act before finishing the Malachor investigations, which will cause you to hit another wall like you did with the Native Council. Once you make it to Siora's village, you learn that her mother and sister have already decided to attack the Alliance. You set up to stop them before they begin their assault, and you're presented with two paths that lead to the same place, both literally and narratively. Siora says that one path takes longer to travel, but is safer, and the other has more wildlife but is shorter in length. It literally does not matter which one you take because you'll arrive too late anyways, but Siora will be convinced that you would have made it in time if you took the shorter path. If you have Afro with you when you catch up with them, then Siora's sister will attack you, forcing you to fight her before progressing. Regardless, the result is the same. Siora learns that her mother fell in battle and you're tasked with healing the surviving natives. This task is time sensitive, but you actually have to try to fail with how much time they give you. You stumble upon the clan banner as you search for the body of Siora's mother, and one of the Alliance soldiers is still alive. Siora freaks out and starts choking him with some roots, and you're given the choice to talk her down or encourage her to kill him. This is one of those situations where the decision really should come before Desarde says something. Siora. Need some help? As with everything else in this game, the result is the same regardless of whether she kills or spares him. You learn that the Alliance has taken her mother and she wants to go find them, except that part happens in her loyalty quest. For now, we're here to investigate the strange ruins that we saw from the battlefield. Upon closer inspection, you see some frescoes and hear a story about when another nation tried to colonize the island generations ago. After years of mistreatment, the natives went to the large volcano at the heart of the island to pray for help against them. And thus the first Nodig were born, taller than a city and strong enough to send the colonizers packing. Desarde says that the colonizers were likely from the continent, and the Malachor could be a curse set upon them for their mistreatment of the natives. You bring the news back to Constantine, and he sends you to speak with Lady Mirage since she was looking into the ruins present on the island. The only thing worth mentioning before the big reveal is that the locals here couldn't seem to figure out how to fix this door when there's literally a box right next to it with the instructions on how to fix it. You find various chests while investigating the ruins that are somehow still intact, and in one of them you find a seal depicting the coat of arms of Serene, proving that the congregation were the evil overlords of yesteryear. My enthusiasm about this plot twist is about as lukewarm as pond water, and I honestly don't think it's very interesting. This doesn't add any depths to the congregation, it just proves that they're just as bad as every other faction in the game. It's also not very hard to figure out that they were the ones who originally built these ruins, not because it's a predictable twist, but because the writers are predictable. The bridge into Leme are actively kidnapping and torturing natives. You're a member of the only faction who wants to have peaceful relations with them. Who else is there to put this backstory on than the congregation? One good thing about this reveal is Siora's reaction. She tells you that she doesn't hold you accountable for the actions of your ancestors and agrees to keep this a secret from the rest of her people for the sake of keeping the congregation and natives on good terms. I think this shows a level of maturity that many characters in other games lack, although it does feed into that problem of there being a serious lack of conflict between you and your companions. Still, I like how this doesn't result in a mandatory loss of reputation with her. You return to Constantine with the news, and Desarde remarks that his illness is getting worse, asking if it's possible that he's been poisoned. After informing him about your discovery, he tells you to go speak with the Admiral to learn more since a journal in one of the chests revealed that the Knots were involved in the colonization efforts. She tells you that they agreed to keep quiet about the events of the previous colonization, but if you do a quick job for her, then she'll tell you everything. Apparently, Teleme and the Ordo Luminous are up to stupid shit again, so you're being sent to investigate. This quest is a detour from what we actually want to be learning, so I'll go easy on the details. You'll be looking into a couple of missing knots from the port, as well as breaking into one of their warehouses to see what had the Inquisition so on edge. It's good to bring Vasco for this part, since there's additional dialogue regarding your discoveries. As it turns out, the knots don't use magic at all. They're just regular sailors who use standard 15th century nautical equipment. They started the rumor about special knot magic 
to discourage competition and maintain a monopoly over their trade. The Inquisition's paranoia towards anything not of their faith caused them to believe the Nazis are responsible for the Malachor because they've yet to fall prey to it. They decided to kidnap some sailors and torture them until they confess, so you go speak to Mommy Cornelia about this, and she concludes that the Inquisitors are a bunch of jackasses who almost cost them their services with the Nazis. Does nobody in this game actually think before doing shit? At least Cornelia calls Domitius out for being an idiot, but seriously, you really shouldn't have to remind somebody that alienating the only group of people that know how to sail is bad for your colonization efforts. The Norts are not believers. We should not be dependent on heretics. Have you gone completely mad, Domitius? We are on an island. How could we not be dependent on the Norts? So, she has every member of the Order Luminous arrested, and we return to the Admiral to learn the full story about the Congregation's last attempt to colonize the island. Tierfordy was discovered 200 years ago, and the Knots sold the location to the Congregation shortly after. The lords they brought here turned out to be complete assholes who exploited both the island and their own workers, so both they and the natives revolted against them. The Congregation swore the Knots to secrecy regarding the events, but still launched silent expeditions to the island after their initial defeat. This is where it's revealed that you were born during one of those expeditions. Your mother was a native who was a prisoner to the Congregation, and you were born on one of their ships. Desarde takes this revelation as a shock, but you probably won't. The entire time you've been here, people have been remarking how you have the likeness of a native. I would never have imagined that you would grow up to resemble the island natives so closely. You have a peculiar face, and it looks familiar. Please, you could pass for a tribe, brother. The first time you saw me, did you really think I was a native? Aside from the way you dress, you resemble a native. I have never seen an Onol Manawi amongst the Rinagse before. Is it so surprising that I made this mistake? Your birthmark, which I covered up with these tasteful sideburns because it looks like a poorly shaved patch of hair, is the mark of one who has bonded themselves with the island. It's not so subtly shoved in your face the entire time you've been here that you're secretly a native, and Desarde is the only person who hasn't figured it out. There's also another problem with this revelation. If Desarde was born on a Knot ship, why isn't he a Knot himself? This isn't even acknowledged by the Admiral. Vasco never brings it up to you, and it makes no sense. By their own laws, anybody born on their ship belongs to their guild, and yet Desarde is the exception. I think a weak explanation for this would be better than no explanation at all, and it just goes to show another crack in the game's world building. Why even bother giving the Knots this characteristic if it's just going to be waved away at the times it would become relevant? The honest answer to this is that the writers probably forgot about it. They already elaborated on the Knots' backstory in the prologue, so it's time to forget about it and move on to something else. So I guess we should go ahead and do the same. At this point, Desarde wants to go speak to Constantine about everything he's learned, but we need to take a quick detour first. We're getting close to the end of the first act, and we need to talk about the various loyalty missions before we do. This is probably the best stepping off point, and at least one of these quests absolutely must be discussed before we hit the dramatic ending of the first act of the game. I initially planned on going through these quests beat by beat like I have everything else so far, but that could easily add another half an hour to this video alone, and not everything that happens is worth mentioning. Of the five loyalty quests, I'd say that only two or three of them are interesting. Siora's quest in particular takes until the third act to even complete because of how long she waits to trigger the final stage, and by that point it doesn't feel worth the time. Not all of these are worthwhile, so I'm not going to pad the video with less interesting topics. Let's start with the two that can be summed up in one paragraph. Vasco approaches you requesting that you help him find out about his true identity. Every Knot secretly laments the loss of the life they never got to live, and Vasco has wanted to know his for a long time. It's revealed that he was born a noble in the congregation, so you spend time trying to track down his family here on the island. You learn that his brother is a major screw-up and save him from getting gutted by some bandits, then Vasco decides that he's proud to be a Knot and he's happy with who he is. There is a fair amount of character development that leads to this conclusion, with him first resenting the Knots for stealing him from a comfortable life as a noble, to then revealing that he hated you for representing everything that he never got to be, but by the end of it, he's happy where he's at. The other half of this quest involves Vasco doing a loyalty mission for the Admiral. Like, they literally call it a loyalty mission. I don't really understand why he needs to do this if he was already trustworthy enough to make it to the rank of captain, but that's more of a criticism about how we'll never learn enough about these factions to understand the finer details. This whole quest is incredibly weak, which is a shame because Vasco is one of my favorite characters in this game. Siora's quest is even more cut and dry. You go to find her mother after the battle, where you learn that she died before she could receive treatment for her wounds. You ask the man in charge to take her body for a proper burial, and if you can't pass the speech check, then he tells you no. I'm actually not sure if passing the speech check lets you bypass most of this quest, or if it just changes the flavor of the dialogue, but I wouldn't be surprised if you still need to complete the next step anyways. 
You find out that he's secretly dealing with Teleme. You interrupt the exchange and force him to give over the body. Where this quest line gets interesting is when you return to Siora's village, where you see that Teleme has sent their missionaries to convert everybody. They claim that Siora's mother made a deal with them to fight against the Alliance, and the conversion of their entire village was part of this deal. The next phase is investigating further to find out if this is true. Siora doesn't believe that her mother would betray their customs for any reason. You eventually learn that Teleme is lying about this part of their agreement, and they destroyed most of the evidence in an attempt to cover their tracks. Just the religious fanatics being assholes again. You drive them out of the village, then wait until after 30 hours of playtime when Siora decides it's time to bury her mother. After that, you're free to exhaust her very limited dialogue options and side conversations and take her to the Smash Zone. Those of you who have played the game will notice how this is a simplification of the events, but I urge you to ask yourself if any of those additional steps add more to the quest than what I just described. Aphra's mission is something I go back and forth about a lot. On one hand, I think it's an interesting exploration into the native beliefs and culture, but you basically get the exact same explanation during the main story, so it ends up feeling like a waste of time. Her quests involve you investigating the rituals that the natives undergo to bond themselves to the earth, becoming on Olmanawi. It's pretty interesting if you're curious about the native culture, but again, you'll get this exact same explanation practically word for word during the third act of the game. Here's the gist of it. The ritual is specific for natives who want to become a Donegad, which are the healers and wise people of their culture. They're privy to more secrets and rituals than regular natives, and they physically bond themselves to the island, which causes them to undergo a physical mutation. Being bonded is referred to as on Olmanawi. Manawi. Not every on Omanawi is Donegad, but all Donegada are on Omanawi. The ritual is performed by slicing your hand open and touching the ground in one of the island's many bonding spots. This summons a Nodig to place a large stone in the ground, which then causes magic roots to hold it in place. This links that person to the island and causes the mutation, which then allows the person to undergo physical changes like growing roots out of their head. The link appears to vary in strength depending on the person performing the ritual, and it's through the stronger bonds that the natives undergo a greater transformation and become a Nodig. It's pretty interesting the first time you learn about it, but I think that's more because you learn so little about every other faction that any amount of exploration into this culture is a breath of fresh air. Oh, and some alliance jackasses show up to try and kidnap the guy who finishes his bonding ritual, because we can't go one quest without reminding the player that everybody here is an asshole. At the very least, you learn that the man abducting the natives is Aphra's former teacher, Dr. Asili. We'll get to that later. So, that's three loyalty missions down, and two to go. As it happens, I think these two are probably the most interesting of the bunch, although Petra's quest in particular makes Desarde look like a complete idiot. Let's start with that one. Petros approaches you shortly after he joins your team and voices his concerns about Constantin. He doesn't think he's an experienced enough politician to avoid being manipulated by the Mother Cardinal, so he wants us to get dirt on her so we can level the playing field. I think this quest is important for one reason. You meet Petros literal minutes after you witness the public execution of an innocent native at the hands of the Inquisition. You're likely to distrust him at this point, so having him go behind his superior's back for the sake of your cousin goes a long way towards making him seem more trustworthy. You get the poop on Cornelia by ransacking her private office in the basement of her palace. My favorite part of this quest is when a servant tells you that you can't enter this area because it's for servants only. So you proceed to go purchase three servant outfits to disguise yourselves. Here you have Desarde with his extremely recognizable birthmark on his face, Vasco with his full body tattoos that are specific to knots, and Petrus who has worked in the palace long enough for everybody to know who he is. Somebody should really tell game designers that changing your shirt isn't a disguise, it's just you with a different shirt on. Anyways, you go ransack the basement where you learn that Cornelia is moving large sums of money that she's acquired through gambling on arena fights to fund orgies for her close friends. We don't know enough about Telemi's faith to say this is a punishable crime, but seeing as there's a brothel in the tavern, I doubt that it is. We don't get anything incriminating here, so Petrus has the bright idea for this next stage of the quest. He's going to organize an arena fight and have Cornelia bet a significant amount of money against you. Then you're going to win so that she's in massive debt. He says that he'll make sure Cornelia has to come to him for the bet money, but it's never explained how he plans on doing this. Now, let's think about this for a second. You're a representative of the Congregation of Merchants, a public official, and your goal is to indebt a foreign leader who has shown no hostilities towards you or your cousin before now, all out of the fear that she could somehow manipulate him. What makes Byrne above this level of scrutiny? He's even more clueless about what his men are doing than Cornelia is, so why is he automatically more trustworthy? This is one of those things that Desarde would never actually do because it could easily backfire and bring the congregation into a war against Teleme. That's assuming that his uncle doesn't throw him in prison first. It's so painfully obvious that Petrus wants to do this because he has a grudge against Cornelia, and you're never given the opportunity to question his motivations or disagree with what he tells you. So, you arrange the arena battle. The organizer tells you not to screw around or you're going to get bodied by your opponent. Yeah. 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 
Something tells me that was just a little bit of an exaggeration. Cornelia now owes you and Petrus an outrageous amount of money, and you're ready to bargain with her about her treatment towards Constantin, treatment that she has yet to prove is worth questioning. She doesn't seem too broken up about the endeavor. This apparently isn't the first time that her and Petrus have gone at it like this. She basically outs Petrus for having an ulterior motive, to nobody's surprise, and it turns out that he's gunning for Cornelia's position as the Cardinal of Teleme. She immediately turns the tables by threatening to reveal information he's kept hidden from us, and he tells her that she doesn't have the right. Petrus, pal, if you're gonna blackmail somebody, you better make damn sure that they don't have anything worse on you. She reveals that Petrus knew your mother, your real mother, and he never told you about it because he was too ashamed for having never tried to help her. The next stage of this quest triggers a while later when Petrus offers to help Desarde track down his surviving family here on the island. Cornelia's debt is never brought up again to my knowledge, although there is a dialogue option I found on my second playthrough that hints at evoking it, and just like Sister Ephesia, this whole thing is just forgotten about. This brings us to Kurt's loyalty mission, which is the longest one of them all. Despite that, I regard this to be the best of the companion quests due to how heavily it affects the main story. You can pick this quest up as early as when you first arrive in New Serene. Kurt thinks that one of the men he recruited prior to your departure, Rainer, would make a suitable bodyguard for Constantin, and he wants your opinion on the matter. He has orders to defend Constantin, but he's also obligated to you as a companion, and he recently learned that Rainer was stationed here in New Serene. After asking around in the barracks, you learn that he died just a few days ago. The official story is that he drowned in the port after a night of drinking, but Kurt swears that he would never have put himself in that situation. The medical examiner corroborates this story, but he's reluctant to let you see the body. After convincing him, you see that Rainer was clearly beaten to death. You confront the medical examiner, who says that a group of soldiers threatened to kill him if he didn't falsify the cause of death. These soldiers didn't wear regiment patches, so we have no clue where they belong to. This begins a long investigation where you eventually learn that there is a secret Shadow Regiment in the Guard where promising recruits are sent to. It's unclear if the commander of the Guard even knows that it exists, but it's likely that he does. Your investigation eventually leads you to the training camp for this regiment. The lieutenants here insist this is a special forces group designed to counteract the natives' magic, but it quickly becomes clear that they're training assassins. The recruits brought here are beaten and tortured if they step out of line, and the biggest troublemakers are subject to, quote, night training, where all the other recruits are ordered to beat them within an inch of their life. The commander not only knows about this operation, he sponsors it, so you and Kurt set out to shut it down. You do this by rescuing one of the recruits who was assigned to night training after snitching on the lieutenants, then you stealth your way past the guards and confront the leaders of the camp. Kurt doesn't want the recruits to be harmed, so you'll need to talk them down from fighting you. You then kill the lieutenants involved and speak with Major Sieglinda about getting the recruits transferred to another regiment. Kurt tells you that Sieglinda has long suspected the commander was corrupt, but Kurt never listened to her. This quest fundamentally changes Kurt's character in a way the other loyalty missions don't. He's seen potential corruption in the guard before, but it was never personal enough for him to question it. You can tell while doing this quest that Raynor was somebody he truly cared about, and he feels personally responsible for his death. This is enough to break his loyalty to the commander for good. This is, hands down, the best loyalty quest in the game, and it's even better given how it affects the main story, so let's go ahead and get back on track. Desarde now knows that he isn't a congregation noble, he's just a native who was adopted by Constantine's aunt. You return to Constantin to share the news where you see he finally decided to see a doctor about his illness. This is one of those scenes that would be better if I just let it play out. And so then, our venerable doctor, what is the verdict? It's... The blood is black. <sighs> Constantin, is this your blood? Constantin, answer me. Constantin, stay with me, Constantin. There is a chance that he is in error. It might be something else. I'm going to die. No, no, Constantine. I will die, like your mother and the others on the continent. I, I am dying. I don't want to die. I don't. No, no, not so soon. It's so good. Constantine, I, I don't want Constantine, I'm here. Pull yourself together. Out. Everyone out! It's an order! Of all the performances in this game, I think this one is probably the best. It's the first time you see any real emotion between these characters since the prologue. Even when Siora basically walks up to Desarde and asks to smash, his reaction is so bland. I also think this is one of the few scenes in the game where the facial animations don't ruin the impact, and while I don't think the reveal is very shocking, Constantine's reaction felt genuine to me. Still, there's one thing that ruins this scene that we'll talk about in a moment. You then tell Constantine everything you've learned, including that you're not actually related to him. He tells you that it doesn't matter 
matter and that it doesn't change anything between you two. He also says that nobody should know that you're not actually a noble. He then calls the guards back in and thus begins the climactic ending of Act 1. The scene that plays next will heavily depend on whether you've completed Kurt's loyalty mission, and this is the only consequence in the entire game that adds context to everything you've done beforehand. If you help Kurt uncover the truth about Rainer's death, then he no longer trusts the commander's intentions, but more importantly, he is now more loyal to you than to the guard itself. He dismisses the troops in the room and warns you that the commander has arrived in New Serene and is staging a coup in every city on the island, starting with you. The coin guard are the de facto military force on the island, so they're already in place to take control should they receive the order. What I like about this twist is that it was set up as far back as when you first arrived in New Serene, back when you went to retrieve the guard's merchandise and saw that the commander was smuggling weapons onto the island. It also explains the adamacy that the shipment make it onto Vasco's ship, because it would have delayed their plans otherwise. No other event in this game has anywhere near the subtlety in its foreshadowing as this one, and it's honestly impressive given the quality of writing in the rest of the game. You're probably thinking, wait, what happens if you didn't do Kurt's loyalty mission? If you ignored Kurt's request, then the corruption in the guard he's witnessed hasn't become personal enough for him to doubt his orders. More importantly, you haven't proved to be worth his loyalty since you wouldn't even bother to set aside time to go see one of his recruits, a recruit that he likely still learned was dead but was never allowed to go investigate. He may not necessarily hate you, but he certainly doesn't like you or trust you, and so when the order comes to assassinate you and your cousin, he doesn't go against it. Sorry, Greenblood. Fight with honor. On guard. I said draw! Once you defeated him, you're given the choice to kill or spare him, and I think this villain arc is wrapped up much nicer if he slit his throat right here. This intimidates the rest of the guards enough to scare them off, and Desarda says that maybe trusting mercenaries over state-run militaries wasn't the brightest idea. At this point, the quest has the same objectives, but the differences don't stop. For one, you'll now need to fight an assassin that was sent to kill all of Constantine's advisors. These assassins aren't here if you did Kurt's quest because you shut down the Shadow Regiment, another small detail that I found really interesting. You can also warn the other cities about the coup to prevent them from being overtaken, then you go after the commander and his lieutenants. I never actually went to get the lieutenants because I thought the quest was time sensitive but it isn't. Instead, your success or failure to capture the commander is based entirely on whether you did Kurt's mission. If you don't warn the other cities and didn't capture the commander, then you'll be given the choice to save the Mother Cardinal or Burren, but you can't do both. One of the cities needs to fall to the coin guard, so I let Burren's bridge come falling down and went to save Cornelia. I was actually hoping that there was a choice to let them both get off by the guard, but you have to save at least one. The one you don't choose will then move to their respective embassy in New Serene. If you get the good ending, then all the cities remain standing and Sieglinda is appointed the new commander of the guard. The coup is an interesting part of this game, and it's the only reason that I did a second playthrough. Once I learned the differences were so drastic, I needed to experience it myself. That being said, there are a myriad of problems with it, and most of them stem from the coin guard themselves. Let's start with the most noticeable issue, the timing. In the span of five minutes, you learn that Desarde is actually a native who was taken from his mother as a child, you learn that Constantine has the Malachor, and then you learn that the commander of the guard is staging a coup in the city. These moments aren't given enough time for the dust to settle before they drop another place plot twist into the mix. Just like this video, the pacing is all wrong. It also doesn't really make sense why the coin guard would want to stage this coup at all. For starters, what do they plan on doing with Tier for D? We don't know enough about the guard to really understand their motivations here, but even if the goal is power for the sake of power, how does taking over a single remote island benefit them? If Kurt has some lines about how the coin guard had a presence in every nation but doesn't have a place to call their own, then I would understand this a little more. Vasco has a line about how the knots have an island that they make their home, but it makes sense for them because they're a guild of sailors. This coup is something you would want to attempt on the continent, not somewhere you could be stranded. This also has one massive problem. How is a guild of mercenaries going to make money when they betray the nations that employ them? I know news takes months to travel from Tier for D to the continent, but seriously, this has to be the most short-sighted goal I've ever seen. The coin guard still has members on the continent, they're still working with the various nations, so how are they going to bring in profits when these nations cut ties with them? How would they survive if the Knots decided to stop servicing the cities they control? This coup is an economic disaster for this guild, and it makes no sense for them to go through with it. You could probably argue that they don't want to take control of the continent because the Malachor is running rampant, but that alone isn't enough to make this decision to overthrow all the governors a feasible one. So, the coup, arguably the most intricately set up moment in the entire game, falls flat on its face in execution. 
It takes all of 10 minutes to complete and has a minimal impact on the rest of the game. Even if you let one of the cities be taken over, nothing about the city itself actually changes. It would have been cool if the place was trashed from all the fighting. There could have been more homeless people as buildings were destroyed. The music could have been a darker rendition to demonstrate how the city is a shadow of its former self. Instead, you just walk right in and speak with Commander Torsten, who has no dialogue about you thwarting his plans. You can't attack him and end this insurgency right here. There's no quest to join an underground resistance of skilled fighters, no schism in the guard between those who question the commander and those who don't. Nothing. You still have accommodations within the city, and the entire incident is swept under the rug. That's all she wrote. I could go on about the problems this part has, but I think I've demonstrated enough how the devs failed to stick the landing on this one, and that's something you'll see a lot in this game. This is one of those things that are an interesting concept with tons of potential but fail to live up to it because the writers didn't want to answer these difficult questions, and the consistency with the quality of writing is what makes this world feel false. Keep in mind, this is only the end of the first act, and things are only going to get worse from here. Welcome to Act 2. If you haven't completed Telemi and the Alliance's Malachor investigations, then you'll need to go do that before proceeding. If you have, then you need to seek out a healer to help alleviate Constantine's suffering. It's worth noting that his condition has worsened significantly since the last time you saw him, which only feels reasonable if you left to save one of the other cities. Otherwise, it feels like a time jump is missing here. You're sent to find three healers that can help Constantine, an Alliance Doctor, a Miracle Healer from Telemi, and the best native healer on the island. Take a guess at which one is the real goal here. If you go recruit the other two, then they've already tried and failed by the time you return with the native, so you can just ignore them. Pointless choices that only waste the player's time? Oh, Greedfall, you never fail to deliver. You set out to find the native healer, Katasak. Before he agrees to join you, he tasks you with helping to solve various problems around his village. There have been an increase in animal attacks lately, and the missionaries are annoying everybody again. Two young villagers have also gone missing, which could be related to either of the previous problems. After speaking with the local hunter and the family of the missing people, you learn that the animals have been enraged since a large white tenlin has been introduced into the region. The hunter says that it's not native to the area, and it's likely the cause of the attacks. You destroy the various nests around the region, and either of the other problems will lead you to the bodies of the young natives. They are meeting in secret since the girl was proposed to another man that she didn't love. After killing the White Tenlin, you learn the missionaries brought it to the region to spike the number of animal attacks and use the natives' fear to better convert them. You can confront them with this information, or you can investigate their camp where you learn that one of the missionaries attempted to rape a native girl and kick their asses until they leave. Just for the record, I did reload a save to see if you could report these people to the Mother Cardinal, and you can't. The lack of remorse that these people have in either circumstance shows how outrageously evil Telemi can be when trying to convert people to their faith, and as with many other things in this game, I think that this is intentional. These acts aren't meant to be justifiable, you're supposed to be disgusted by them. Once you've solved all the village's problems, Katazak agrees to come with you to help treat Constantine. You can also now gain access to the council chamber since you're trusted by Katazak, so we can continue seeking out an Omel Frictimen to find a cure for the Malachor. But first... Okay, I know what you're thinking. Enough with the detour, shrimp, let's get on with the main story already. Also, your name is stupid, and you took too long to make this video. All of these are true, except for the name, I actually think it rolls off the tongue quite well. But we still have to wrap up the side quests from before. I will be condensing them like I did the last quest, since the only important parts are the discoveries at the end, so this section isn't going to overstay its welcome. There's a lot of game left to cover, and I don't want to pad the video with constant interruptions. Oh look, that's what I'm doing anyways. Let's start with Teleme so I can get through it faster. The theologians continued following in the footsteps of St. Matthias and found themselves in the swamp where you fought the Nodag before. Brother Virgil, still not very motivated, insists that Sister Eugenia is leading them to their death. After investigating some of the missing expedition members, you learn that they were murdered and posed to make their deaths look like an accident. To nobody's surprise, Brother Virgil is the culprit. He explains that he was sent by the Ordo Luminous to stop the expedition because of the danger that these discoveries posed to Teleme. Even if the truth about their faith were revealed, it could be rejected by much of the population and lead to a civil war. You have the choice of convincing Eugenia to head back to Eden and forgetting about the expedition for a pittance of 100 gold, ordering him to leave the expedition, or revealing everything to Eugenia. Is it Eugenia or Eugenia? You know, you know what? Fuck that stupid ass name. I chose the last option, which results in a fight breaking out and Virgil escaping anyways. From here, you're sent to investigate the final holy site detailed in the tablets, and this is when you uncover the specifics about Telemi's religion. It's confirmed that St. Matthias learned much of what he knows from the natives, and that theirs and Telemi's beliefs are actually one and the same. The problem is that St. Lucius twisted these teachings, either out of fear or malice, and thus Telemi's entire culture was built on only half-truths. This is a monumental discovery for the theologians, and a rather stale one for the player. It's certainly interesting and adds some depth to Telemi as a faction, but it hardly feels unique. All this shows is that Telemi's actions towards the natives are exactly how they appear on the surface, borderline evil. Their zealous actions are no longer simply questionable, they're built on a lie, and this makes the faction less sympathetic, not more. 
So, you report these discoveries to Eugenia, and the Order Luminous arrives to try and kill you. After dealing with them, you move on to report them to the Mother Cardinal herself. I brought Petrus and Siora with me because I felt like they'd be useful, and they do present some strong arguments to Cornelia. She tells you that this could lead to a civil war and accuses you of trying to weaken the nation. You need an intuition of three to present the very obvious solution of telling her to go visit the cave herself. You've already cleared it of beasts, why do you need to have maximum intuition to tell her this? This is literally the first thing somebody would suggest in this situation. You can tell her about the attack from the Ordo Luminous, but Domitius will wave it away as the actions of a few rogue members. I don't know how this dialogue is handled after Cornelia has them arrested, but knowing this game, it doesn't change much. I personally failed to convince her that sharing the information is the best course of action. Petrus and Siora did, and she decides to share it with the continent. This may feel like a strange jump in time, talking about the second part of a quest later in the game than when I completed it, but that's also how my playthrough went. I completed all of Telemi's quests quickly, and the bridge quests were shelved for later. I actually didn't begin the final bridge quest until after the start of Act 3, so I decided to present them both now to keep the pacing of this video consistent. Moving on to the bridge, you return to Burn after solving the issue with the caravans, although you're never directed to, so you'd be forgiven for missing this one. I only realized this after I was sent to speak with him for the main questline, and Desardi demonstrated his bipolarity as he went from assuring Burn that he would assist him with his problems, to shouting at him for having an assassin sent after us, to reporting that we took care of his caravan problem. These happen back to back, and it felt incredibly awkward. You track down the native camp and speak with their chief about the impending attack on Hickman and the kidnapped natives. You learn that they're being taken somewhere called the Laboratory, where they're experimented on, tortured, and eventually killed. You're then interrupted by an Alliance attack on the camp. This is the second time the Alliance used you to get to somebody else, and you're given the choice of fighting alongside the natives or helping the soldiers kill the rebels. I decided to stop the attack, then return to Burren to confront him about using you. Again. Like, Jesus Christ, dude, get something done yourself for a change. Byrne tells you that he didn't know about the attack on the camp, but he does finally admit that he knew about the laboratory all along, even though he wasn't aware natives were being used as test subjects. This brings us back to what Siora told him during her outburst if you brought her during your first conversation with him. She basically tells him that the only reason the natives are fighting back is because her people are being kidnapped, and Byrne doesn't question her or try to get more information. I blame the writers on this one, but Byrne is a fucking moron, and I just cannot help but think that this is 100% him. His men have tried to kill us like two or three times now, and he doesn't even have the common courtesy to give us some Chuck E. Cheese tokens. I guess they all burned with the caravans. Moving off this tangent... Dr. Asili is in charge of the laboratory, and given what Afra has said about him earlier, there's no real mystery what he's doing here. You break into the laboratory, free the knots and the natives that were being tested on, and you face off with Dr. Asili, who urges you to let him continue his research. He says that the natives are naturally resistant to the Malachor, so he was experimenting on them to isolate the source of their immunity and develop a cure. Once he's done talking, you fight him. He tells you that you can't kill him because his knowledge is too valuable. Let's talk about my decision here. We learned in the prologue that the Alliance is no stranger to using human test subjects to develop a cure for the Malachor. Burren has proven to be incompetent beyond belief, and every encounter you've had with him has been less than pleasant. I don't trust the Alliance to not simply reassign Asili somewhere else or let him go the second our back is turned, so I kill him right here. If you do arrest him, then you start another quest where you gather evidence to have him executed, but what's important is that I actually thought that they wouldn't punish him. After looting his office, you'll find evidence that Asili poisoned both you and Constantin. The drinks you were given when you arrived were spiked with a Malachor, and it's only thanks to your bond to the island that you were able to resist it. Since Constantin isn't a native by birth, he wasn't so lucky. Even now, as I type this, as I read this, as I edit this part of the video, and as you watch it, Four separate moments in time that are going to be weeks apart, I cannot fucking believe the absolute stupidity of this character. You can tell Burren what the good doctor did, but you can't tell Constantin. Poisoning a foreign leader for the sake of experimentation is the kind of shit that can drag you into a war, and I am absolutely flabbergasted that he did this. What was he trying to achieve here? The note doesn't say that he knew you were a native, he doesn't tell you this himself, and this decision not only makes no sense, it demonstrates such an unbelievable level of stupidity in both this character and the writing of this quest. I can only think of one reason why this detail exists, and it's the same point that I have been leading you on with throughout the course of this video. You are meant to hate these factions. By the end of this quest, the bridge was officially on my shit list, and that's why I let the guard take over Hickman on my second playthrough. Asili didn't just poison some random governor of the island, this is the son of the motherfucking de facto leader of the congregation. This man sat down, tumbled this around in his brain, and decided, yes, we should commit a war crime and see what happens. 
People lose their shit over wearing a mask at the grocery store these days, much less injecting shit straight into your bloodstream. If the coup is the most interesting part of the story, this is Greedfall's lowest moments. And if the writers weren't prepared to answer basic questions about Asili's motivations beyond he's insane, they should have made it more apparent that he has completely lost his mind. Because this probably has to be the most brain-dead thing I've ever seen anybody do in any game ever. Now that your official Salty Shrimp rant has concluded, I think we should go ahead and get back to the story, which is easier said than done because I'm still seething over that last tangent. You return to the native cancel to seek an audience with Enol Milfrictiman. You're told to do something called the Trial of the Waters, where you're meant to reveal your true self. You can't actually fail this trial, even if you solve every problem with combat, and you're told that only the High King can grant you an audience with the Island God. Unfortunately for you, he disappeared months ago and nobody knows where he's at. Does it feel like the trial was pointless with that context? Yep. You return to New Serene where you learn that Constantine is missing. Katazak convinced him to go on a pilgrimage of sorts and they were attacked along the way. The guard says it sounded like an avalanche of sorts so he left to go get help. You set out to find them, or you set out to go find the High King. It's actually strange to me that you're given the choice here because even if you reach the end of the questline to find the High King, one of your companions says, hey Jackass, your cousin is still missing and you can't proceed until you finish that quest. You retrace Constantine's steps where you see that Katazak planned on performing some sort of ritual for him. You also see that the battle took place here with evidence of native magic being involved. Desarde begins to question if Katazak might be involved, but a number of dead coin guard members also cast suspicion on a nearby outpost. You have the choice of going back to Katazak's village to speak with his assistant, or going to interrogate the captain of the outpost. One of these is a loading screen away, and the other is a five minute walk. Take a guess at which of them is required. I'll give you a hint, it's not the assistant. Honestly, why does this choice even exist if it doesn't matter? You'll find out what happened to Katazak regardless, so just like with the optional healers, why give the player a choice if it's meaningless? Anyways, you go investigate the outpost where you're told that the men were sent away when they heard the fighting. One of the soldiers is wounded and unconscious, so you need to go heal him to learn more. This makes the choice to make a several day detour to go to the native village while this kid is on his deathbed seem a little more ridiculous now, doesn't it? Healing him involves you making a potion since the doctor is out of ingredients, and then you need to wait until the next day to speak with him. The nearest campsite is a 30 second walk from the outpost, and I seriously don't see why we needed to wait at all. If it's really that necessary that you waste the player's time, at least put a campsite inside the outpost. I can't stress enough how these little moments that waste the player's time become exhausting by the end of your first playthrough, and it makes the entire game feel unnecessarily padded. The soldier tells you that Constantine's troop was attacked by wild animals, and after regaining consciousness on the battlefield, he heard the voices of natives, which he somehow discerned were the rebels. You confront the rebels with this knowledge, and they tell you that they pulled Katasak's body from the battlefield and didn't find any trace of Constantine. You search Katasak's body, either by yourself with an intuition of two or with Afra if you lack the skill, and you determine that he was hit by a flaming rock at a high velocity. In order to understand what happened, you need to get Mev to perform a ritual that will allow her to relive his last moments. This is all incredibly convenient island magic that has never been brought up until now, so I'll skip to the point. The person who killed Katazak and took Constantine was the High King, Vinbar. Thus begins your hunt for the High King. Yes, I'm gonna say again for the fifth time in this section, your choice is meaningless. The divergent paths for the story are stupid and they shouldn't exist. You're already given plenty of motivation right here to want to hunt down Vinbar. This choice is redundant, and it was a waste of resources for the developers to record additional dialogue for something this meaningless. Okay, I'm gonna burn through this quest at record speed, because 90% of it is just filler. You track down Vinbar's village full of isolationist natives who somehow speak English, that's not contrived, and you learn that the only person who can help you find him is his wife. You track her down and find that she's being tortured by some bridge scientists, the same scientists you rescued when you recruited Afra. The spy who tried to kill you is here too if you let him live. You can try to convince them to leave, get Afra to talk them down, or just murder them. You then speak with Vinbar's wife, Sarah. She tells you that she doesn't trust you or your intentions, but she's willing to help because you saved her life. You find a special cave of knowledge that Vinbar frequently went to, and you learn that he's in the process of transforming into a Nadaig, which Sarah explains must be why he was so distant with her. Desarde stupidly lets it slip that Constantine was kidnapped by Vinbar, and Sarah locks you in the cave out of fear that you're going to kill him. Conveniently, there's another way out, and if you spare the scientist, then you'll see that she killed them too. You continue tracking down Vinbar, and will eventually be cut off by Sarah and a group of natives. There's no way to avoid fighting her, and the key item she holds is necessary for progressing. If you ignore Constantine and tried finding Vinbar first, then you meet Sarah back at her village and kill her there. The rest of the village doesn't react to this, and the fact that she magically disappears until after you find out where Constantine was taken is beyond contrived. 
You travel further up the mountain until you find Vinbar attempting to bury Constantin under some rocks. He tells you that Constantin will be the end of us all, and thus begins our fight. He's pretty easy to go down, but after defeating him, you watch as he transforms into a Nodig, and once you kill him, you take Constantin back to New Serene. A few days pass, and you see that Constantin is alright. Well, he's alive at least. Katazak's plan to cure him of the Malachor was to bond him to the island, and it was successful despite leaving him looking like a corpse. He describes what the ritual was like, which essentially invalidates Aphra's loyalty quest. With Constantin cured, you can now resume the task of seeking an audience with Enel Milfrictimen, which means we've officially completed Act 2 and are moving on to the final act of the game. I went through that kind of fast. If I'm being honest, I think Act 2 has too much padding. There's a ton of backtracking, pointless choices, and the only good part is your encounter with Venbar at the end. Act 3 is going to be much worse, and I'm not going to waste any time getting through it. You return to the council to let them know that you were forced to kill Vinbar. Whether or not this guy believes that it was self-defense will depend on your reputation, but nothing changes regardless. It's now time for the natives to elect a new High King. We can't guarantee that whoever is given the title will help us meet Enel Milfrictimen, so we're going to rig the election in favor of somebody who will. Your choices are thus. Ullman, a man who has previously stabbed you in the back under the guise of progress towards peace between the islanders and colonizers. Dunkus, probably the wisest chief on the island who preaches patience in the face of adversity, and Durdra, who has already promised to drive out the colonist or die trying. Take a guess at which choice is the correct one. All three of them will tell you about a special crown worn by the High Kings of times past. Whoever you present this crown with will agree to give you an audience with Enel Milfrictimen, so you set out to retrieve it for them. Yes, this quest is ripped straight from Skyrim Civil War questline. Once you grab the crown, Durdra arrives and demands that you give it to her instead. You can ask her about her intentions as High Queen, and she won't lie to you. She wants your people gone, but since you're technically a native and a friend of her clan, she says that you'll be welcome to stay. This is likely a bluff if you're not friendly with the natives, but you can believe her if you are. I decided to give the crown to Dunkus on my first playthrough because he's just such a bro. Durdra had to wait until my second playthrough to get it. With one of the three now reigning as High King or Queen, you make your way to meet Enel Milfrictimen. You're told to stick to the path on the right or you might die, and trying to go to the left isn't allowed. Come on spiders, let me have fun, damn it! Once you reach the sanctuary, you see a tree with many faces that speaks to you. This is when you finally get some answers about what the Malachor even is, and I can't say I'm satisfied with them. For over 30 hours, the game has been leading you on about the mystery of the Malachor. You probably got sick of hearing about it long before now, but the writers have done everything in their power to make sure you know it's a big deal. It's a plague that turns your blood black, poisons your body, and kills you slowly and painfully. You followed every lead, every possibility to find a cure, and now that you're standing face to face with a god, you're told that the Malachor is the source of... Pollution. The constant industrialization on the continent has poisoned their food and water, and so the only way to cure the Malachor is to plant trees and give back to the earth. Let's be honest here. This explanation is not good, but I'd probably feel that way about anything that tries to explain what the Malachor actually is at this point. This is less of a fault of the Malachor itself, and more of a fault with how long the concept has built up. By the time you reach this point, the mystery has become more interesting than the subject it's surrounding, and not even the lack of an explanation would have satisfied me. The Malachor is an interesting concept, but I don't think its role in the story was handled properly, and by the time you finally learn what causes it, it feels empty. You came all the way to Tier D to be told that the reason an entire continent is dying of the plague is because you need to plant more trees. And somehow, with all the investigations and experiments, no one thought to test the water supply for traces of the disease. Apparently nobody took the time to isolate how the Malachor spreads and take steps to stop it. Again, I could go on about this topic for longer, but I already went on a tangent earlier, so we'll just cut it here. I think I've made my point. The Talking Tree also warns you about Constantine, saying that he's stealing power from the island. You're interrupted when an intruder is spotted, which wakes up the giant lightning-breathing lizard. You escape the sanctuary and return to New Serene to speak with Constantine. Standing before you are emissaries from the Alliance and Teleme if you stop the coup, and the guard if you didn't. They tell you that both Hikmet and San Mateus are receiving frequent attacks from the wildlife, and they believe the natives might be involved. Constantine tells you that they don't have any resources to spare, and Desarde volunteers to go help them. Once they leave, you speak with Constantine about your findings. Once you do, you head out to stop the animal attacks. Both of these quests go relatively the same. Defend the outpost from three waves of animals, then track down and kill the Nodag responsible. You also learn during this quest that the natives were being attacked by the creatures as well. Desarde mentions that they look sick. They're covered in ulcers and putting off this black smoky aura. The first time I saw this, I thought that Constantine had infected the island with the Malachor whenever he was bonded, and that is what was causing the creatures to become enraged. You return to Constantine, who thanks you for your hard work, and tells you that he's going out for a walk. After interrogating one of his guards, he tells you that he frequently goes outside the city with 
without any protection. You search his quarters where you find out that Constantine has been bonding himself to multiple places on the island to grow his power. You track down his next bonding site and set out to confront him. He doesn't really explain himself, but he says that he'll tell you everything he's planning when the time is right. Hold them back, but do not kill him for anything in the world. Fun fact, you can still die here despite Constantine's orders. At this point, you're in the final stretch of the game. You're sent out to investigate his plans and find allies. This is where your reputation comes into play, but this literally changes nothing. Doesn't that sound familiar? You track down Constantine's hiding place and learn that he plans to overtake the talking tree. But before we're allowed to assemble the perfect army and stop him from marching on the sanctuary, we need to go fight two more Nodag in different parts of the island, then get the natives to break his bond and weaken his power. Bear in mind that by this point in the game, you have fought what feels like dozens of these things, and being forced to fight two more is just unnecessary padding. There's an interview by Fallout designer Scott Benny about why he didn't put more side quests in the cathedral near the end of the first Fallout game. To quote him directly, I almost regret not doing more with the cathedral, but I did my best not to throw in side quests because I thought at that time that the player would be pretty much streaking for the end game, and any side quest at this point would be more annoying than useful. There's a time for speed bumps, and there's a time when you have to let them cut loose. These fights could be cut and literally nothing would be lost, so once again, why do they exist in the first place? I think the devs could have taken a couple pointers from Scott Benny and let the player go straight to the sanctuary. Once you're done with mandatory detour number 72, you make your way to the sanctuary to stop Constantine's invasion, but you're too late. He's already broken through by the time you arrive. While you are out gathering the perfect army to stop Constantine, you probably imagined that these nations would set aside their differences to work together to achieve a greater victory. This should be the moment where dialogues are open between old enemies and hatchets are temporarily buried, all for the greater good. Instead, you have three separate groups where only the people with the least amount of conflict work together. Coin Garden Alliance, Natives and Knots, and then Teleme all by themselves at the end, because they truly hate everybody. The game is seriously bending over backwards to avoid addressing any sort of real conflict between these groups, and I think the execution speaks for itself, and we should just move on. You start with a full party, but your companions all stay back with their respective factions, leaving you to face Constantine alone. You defeat the giant lightning-breathing lizard, demonstrating just how desperately this game needs some boss variety, and Constantine stops it before it kills you. It's here when you finally get some answers to what Constantine is doing. He isn't seizing power for the sake of power, he wants you and him to ascend to godhood and let the old world die. He says that the world has used, manipulated, and even tried to kill you, and here he's been given the opportunity to ascend above it and finally free yourselves from your political obligations. He's willing to kill to make this happen, but he's not willing to kill you. You're given the choice, join him and become the new gods of the island, or kill him and stop his plan. Before we discuss the endings, we need to discuss this choice. Remember how I said that every choice you're given in this game is something that Desarde would do. A few of these may feel out of character, but I don't think this is one of them. This is a decision that he is really considering, and I think I know why. You've heard me say many times throughout this video that you're not supposed to like the game's factions. Think back to everything they've done. Teleme won't hesitate to kill people who don't follow their faith, and the lengths they go through to convert the natives without any regard for their lives is truly disgusting. The Alliance is no better, and let's not forget that Dr. Asili is responsible for everything that is happening right now. If he didn't get in his head that he should infect you and Constantine with the Malachor, we wouldn't even be here having this discussion. Now let's think of everything they've done to you personally. The number of times that somebody from these factions that are meant to be your allies attempted to kill you. The way that you've been used by people, and let's not forget the attempted coup. Have you ever felt any true loyalty to these factions? Have you ever trusted them or their leaders? What about their intentions? Do you really want a world run by the Alliance, Teleme, the Queen Guard, or even the Congregation? Think of how these people have treated outsiders, how the Knots and Natives were constantly subject to abuse simply for being different. Is this really a world you want to defend? By the time I was reaching the end of Act 1, I, and by extension Desarde, were already jaded. I started losing my patience with the people who crossed me, often resorting to violence simply because I felt the need to punish those involved. I saw myself standing by the Knots and Natives more often, going as far as to kill a silly because I didn't trust the Alliance to actually punish him for his crimes. Remembering back to the man from the prologue who had his reputation destroyed for speaking out against these very same methods. Here is the man responsible for this suffering. Why bother with the justice system when I can just kill him and end this now? I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission by this point. The point being, I was tired of these factions and these characters, but through it all was Constantine. He constantly tells you how much he worries about your safety, that he hates himself for repeatedly putting you in harm's way. He's always thanking you for everything you do. Whenever you tell him that you're not actually his cousin, he responds by telling you that this means nothing to him. Whenever you try to stop him from overtaking the island, whenever you tell him he's gone insane, he still orders the Nodag not to kill you. 
He offers you supreme power, and through this power, freedom from a dying world that brought about their own demise. Let the Malachor kill the continent, they brought it on themselves. I don't know if for a fact the spiders intended for this choice to have so much weight, or if the frustrating lack of depth of these factions was meant to reinforce Constantine's arguments, but I found this to be a surprisingly heavy decision at the end of such a mediocre game. The decision at this point comes down to whether you believe the world can change for the better, or if you think that letting it die is the best solution. You also need to think of the talking tree, the natives, the knots, and all these people that haven't always wronged you and don't deserve what you're about to put them through. By taking Constantine's offer, you're also choosing selfishness and cynicism, but you're also choosing to stand with the one person who truly cares about you. Call me crazy, but I think that's the right choice. Well, that would be the case, but the game actually ruins this decision by the inclusion of a best ending. You can cure the Malachor, you can change the foundation of Telemi's society, and regardless of whether or not you did the companion loyalty missions, most of them ended up getting their best endings anyways. Even if you put Durdra on the throne, Aphra is still somehow working with Dunkas to research the native culture. With Dunkas on the throne, the natives begin taking steps towards peace with the colonizers, and yet somehow hostilities towards the bridge are as bad as ever. I hope you see the problem with these ending slides. There's absolutely nothing stopping them from contradicting each other, and it shows a clear lack of thought in their implementation. And that could be Greedfall's tagline, a clear lack of thought. At least with a bad ending, the slides are always the same, but I don't see why this game needed to have ending slides anyways. Why not just implement a final cutscene for both endings? The good ending could show you boarding Vasco's ship as you head back to the continent, looking out at the boundless sea as you think of everything that happened since your arrival. Maybe you left this place in a better state than you arrived, or maybe things will only get worse. It will give you a brief moment to ponder your journey before returning to the continent to, hopefully, put an end to the Malachor with the knowledge that you've acquired. The bad ending could show you and Constantine doing something similar as you watch the the ships holding the survivors of your island-wide purge sailing away. Desardi could take a moment to question if they made the right decision, and Constantine would assure him that it doesn't matter. What's done is done, so all you can do is enjoy your newfound freedom. It would be a happy ending in a twisted way, demonstrating how neither he nor Desardi are evil, they only sought their own happiness above all else. And they know as they watch the ship sail away from Tirfordi that they just damn the world, but it's unclear if they actually care. Both of these endings leave some room for interpretation while still being conclusive, and I think that would have been a greater punctuation to mark the end of this game than a couple half-assed ending slides that pat you on the back for completing the game's checklist of uninteresting side content. So, this brings us to the conclusions, and this is the part where I try to take everything I've said so far and wrap it up in a way that makes this entire video feel worth your time. I mentioned at the start of this video that I felt like I had way too much to say, and I still hold to that. I've cut out tangent after tangent so far, but it does seem like things ended up much more structured than I initially thought. With that said, let's do some conclusioning. Greedfall is, at best, mediocre. The combat is better than games like The Witcher 3, but that doesn't make it good. There's a serious lack of build depth and Tactician owns the battlefield in almost every way, and yet it feels more like a skill set than a fighting style. Magic and melee combat are boring, and I will always regard this game for having shitty combat. The story is a hot mess of contrivances, conveniences, and shallow writing. Details are brought up and immediately forgotten about whenever they would become relevant, and it hardly feels like the game is building towards a meaningful ending. Is it any surprise, then, that it really doesn't? I could go on and on about the lack of depth in these factions, these characters, but I think I've just about exhausted those topics for everything they're worth. That being said, it's still worth mentioning just how bad these elements of the game are, and that they only serve to bring down the entire experience. So, what does that leave us with? Well, we get a game that feels like a surface-level exploration of an RPG, a game that takes inspirations from other studios but fails to tie it together in a meaningful way, and a game that I never want to play again. I think this was an admirable attempt from a studio that clearly cared about this project, but I can't help but feel like they put too much emphasis on being like Dragon Age, or like The Witcher, that they forgot to lean on their own talents. Spiders didn't need to try and take on the throne of Bioware, they needed to cater to their own niche and be the best that they could be, but why wouldn't you want to make RPGs like Bioware whenever they're so universally acclaimed? So, at the end of this video that is admittedly shorter than my initial expectations, I think we can come to a simple conclusion. I just don't like this game, but I do think it has potential. There is some real talent at this studio, and I think that they should be looking inward for inspiration, not outward. Spiders will never be Bioware, but they will always be spiders, and it's important that they recognize this and try to find their own identity. Thanks for watching, guys. I know this video took me ages to get done, seeing as I started it back in June, but hey, it's done now. 
I did take several breaks while making it because I got burned out on it a couple times, but seeing as I am running out of hard drive space to record more gameplay footage, I suppose I should go ahead and get this done so I can delete the 770 gigs that are being used. I'm ready to move on to the next project by this point, so I'm glad that this is finally out of the way. I'd also like to thank all the people who have subscribed to me since I started this video, and I hope the rest of you didn't get too annoyed with the wait for this video. As always, I appreciate you guys for watching, and I will see you next time.